Okay, Mr. Marshall, we are live. You have a quorum. We are recording this meeting. The attendees are coming in. We have an attendee here. Um, I believe you're good to go. All right, thank you, Pam. Welcome to the Amherst Planning Board meeting of November 16th, 2022. My name is Doug Marshall, and as the chair of the Amherst Planning Board, I am calling this meeting to order at 6.33 p.m. This meeting is being recorded and is available live stream via Amherst Media. Minutes are being taken. Pursuant to Chapter 20 of the Acts of 2021 and extended by Chapter 22 of the Acts of 2022 and extended again by the state legislature on July 16th, 2022, this planning board meeting, including public hearings, will be conducted via remote means using the Zoom platform. The Zoom meeting link is available on the meeting agenda posted on the town website's calendar listing for this meeting, or go to the planning board webpage and click on the most recent agenda, which lists the Zoom link at the top of the page. No in-person attendance of the public is permitted. However, every effort will be made to ensure the public can adequately access the meeting in real time via technological means. In the event we are unable to do so for reasons of economic hardship or despite best efforts, we will post an audio or video recording, transcript or other comprehensive record of proceedings as soon as possible after the meeting on the town of Amherst website. Board members, I will take a roll call. When I call your name, unmute yourself, answer affirmatively and return to mute. Bruce Colden. Here. Uh, Tom Long. Present. Andrew McDougall. Present. I, Doug Marshall, I'm present. Janet McGowan. Here. Johanna Newman. Here. And Karen Winter. Here. Thank you all. Board members, if technical issues arise, we may need to pause temporarily to fix the problem and then continue the meeting. If the discussion needs to pause, it will be noted in the minutes. Please use the raise hand function to ask a question or make a comment. I will see your request and call on you to speak. After speaking, remember to remute yourself. To the public, the general public comment item is reserved for public comment regarding items not on tonight's agenda. Please be aware the board will not respond to comments during general public comment period. Public comment may also be heard at other times during the meeting when deemed appropriate. Please indicate you wish to make a comment by clicking the raise hand button when public comment is solicited. If you have joined the Zoom meeting using a telephone, please indicate you wish to make a comment by pressing star nine on your phone. When called on, please identify yourself by stating your full name and address and put yourself back into mute when finished speaking. Residents can express their views for up to three minutes or at the discretion of the planning board chair. If a speaker does not comply with these guidelines or exceeds their allotted time, their participation may be disconnected from the meeting. All right, so the first item on our agenda for this evening, uh, and we're starting this item at 6.37 p.m., uh, is our uh, review and approval of minutes However, uh, I don't believe we have any minutes uh, available for review tonight. So uh, unless the staff wants to contradict me, I think we'll just go ahead and move on to the second item. All right, uh, seeing some nodding heads. So uh, the second item um, is the public comment period. So at this time, members of the public, uh, if you would like to make any comments on items that are not on tonight's agenda, this is the time to do that. Uh, you're, you will be invited to make comments on items that are on the agenda later in the meeting when we discuss that topic, each topic. Uh, at this time, I only see one uh, 
participant as an, a public attendee. Uh, that's Jonathan Gerfine, and I believe he's uh, waiting for his topic to come up later in the meeting. Um, I don't see that he wants to make any public comment at this time. So we'll move right along to item three, the zoning bylaw public hearing. Um, the time now is 6.38, and so the intro. In accordance with the provisions of Mass General Law 40A, these public hearings have been duly advertised and notice thereof has been posted and is being held for the purpose of providing the opportunity for interested citizens to be heard regarding the zoning bylaw for food and drink establishments, Article 3, use regulations, Article 5, accessory uses, Article 11, administration and enforcement, and Article 12, definitions. To see if the town will vote to amend Article 3, use regulations, to delete existing use categories in Section 3.352.0, Class one, uh, restaurant, cafe, lunchroom, cafeteria, or similar place, section 3.352.1. Class two, restaurant or bar, and section 3.352.2. Class three, drive up restaurant. And to add the following use categories, section 3.352.0. Restaurant, cafe, bar with food or other similar food slash beverage establishment where food is available at all times. Section 3.352.1, bar with no food served. Section 3.352.2, nightclub in section, nightclub. And section 3.352.3, any of the above food or drink establishments with occupant capacity of more than 250 occupants and to add standards and conditions for these uses, and to amend Article 5, accessory uses, sections 5.041, 5.042, and 5.043, to allow seasonal outdoor dining as an accessory use to a principal use authorized by section 3.3, to allow outdoor furnishings associated with such use to remain in place between November 1 and April 1, as long as the use is active and operational, to remove the prohibition on outdoor heating and cooling devices, and to allow live or pre recorded entertainment as an accessory use to a principal use authorized by Section 3.3, and to delete reference to drive in restaurants, and to amend Article 11, Administration and Enforcement. To, pr- to rearrange the paragraphs describing when site plan review is not required and to clarify the requirements and process for granting administrative approval and to amend Article 12 definitions by clarifying Section 12.05 bar and by deleting Section 12.11 drive up restaurant and any associated renumbering that may be necessary. This uh, hearing is continued from November 2nd, 2022. All right, do we have any board member disclosure? I do not see any. Uh, this, uh, Chris, do you intend to make the application or will this be Nate tonight? This will be Nate and I think we'll be accompanied by Rob Mora eventually. Okay, so take it away, Nate. Sure. Uh, Andrew had just raised his hand. I don't know. Oh, okay. Andrew. Oh, thanks, Doug. Thanks, Nate. Yeah, I, was, I just want to make sure it says more than 250 occupants, but w- that number's changing, right? Right. So the original um, we'll keep the language the original. original proposal. And so, right. <laughs> thanks. <clears throat> yeah. Hi, everyone. Nate Malloy, a planner with the town. I was going to share my screen. I think that might be the easiest way. Oh, that's interesting. Um, the uh, let me see if I can zoom in a little bit. The um, what's shown in blue is what was changed uh, for the November second meeting after you know some discussion with the planning board and CRC, and what's shown in green is what's been added since the last you know public hearing with the planning board and the and the community resources committee. <clears throat> um, so you know I. I'll just walk through them, I guess, quickly. The uh, 
you know, we changed the 250 occupant capacity to 200 patrons. Um, you know, that's interior and exterior, and that's, you know, whether they're seated or standing. And so it doesn't include staff. Um, we think that, uh, you know, the 200 patrons is easier um, to understand and control, you know, manage. Staff can vary, you know, from, you know, three or four to maybe 15 on a busy night. And so really it's the, the patrons that would be the, um, the threshold now. And so that's something, you know, we're asking for, um, you know, we're proposing to ask for a layout plan with occupant capacity for indoor and outdoor dining. So, you know, every establishment would have to list what, you know, what their patron capacity would be. So um, Nate, Nate, that would be a, uh, an additional posting beyond the assembly code occupancy? No, so we're proposing to, um, I guess I should have stricken more, but it would have been just 200 patrons is the, you know, the, the capacity is no more than 200 patrons. So it's not, um, you know, the occupants, it's just the patrons. Is that? Well, uh, I, I, I don't have any problem with the text here. I guess the question of posting just is a different question, you know. In posting the legal ad, you mean, or? No, I mean, every assembly space has to have a plaque oh. on the wall that says, uh, so many people can occupy this room. Right, oh, and, right. And right. are you saying there needs to be another plaque that says there's so many patrons? No, so that's part of the permit, right? So that's not part of a, okay. a building or fire code. So, you know, those signs you see <clears throat> are for fire and safety, not necessarily for land use permitting. Right, okay. Um, you know, and we're also proposing in the BN uh, where, you know, a bar, a nightclub or a larger establishment. And, you know, at one, at one point, Previously, we had said by special permit, we're proposing to prohibit those and have them uh, not be allowed at all in the BN and only the proposed restaurant, cafe, or bar with food or similar establishment would be allowed through site plan review. And so there's some concern about having more impactful uses in the BN. Uh, in standards and conditions number five, we, we added some language about uh, specific management strategies for alcohol service, such as hours of operation, or hours of service and patrons leaving the establishment. Again, <clears throat> with the management plan, all these categories we see here, hours of operation, trash refuse storage, you know, these are um, fields within the management plan the applicant has to complete. And then they become standards and conditions. So, you know, we can add more. We do say any other requested information. So what we're really doing is building a number of criteria, you know, review criteria that an applicant has to complete uh, that then become conditioned. So if they say they want to operate until midnight, that's that's it. If they want to go beyond that, that's a change. Um, you know, they have to provide their signs, their you know how they're going to provide for queuing, lighting, delivery, noise containment. So all those things we expect that will be completed, and then they become standards and conditions. So we're adding some language about alcohol service specifically. And the other change is um, well, in addition, is a new. A new one, number 11, that there shall be no alcohol service after 1 a.m. And so that's something that's been common practice by the ZBA and the Board of Licensing Commissioners. So uh, it's never been codified before, codified before, or a, a, you know, it's not a town policy. It's been common practice. And so we're proposing that in the bylaw. And you know, there wouldn't really be an exception to that. So there may be some existing establishments that have previous permits that allow a different uh, end time for alcohol service. You know, and as we said, an existing special permit uh, doesn't just go away on a property, it remains. And so, you know, typically in the last, you know, five years, 10 years, 1 a.m. has been the ending time. Um, and so, you know, we're just saying that that could be, um, you know, put in the bylaw. So typically if a alcohol service ends at one, you know, um, the permit would allow up to an hour afterward to clean up and close, close, uh, close the establishment. So that's not necessarily a closing time, but it is end of service time. Uh, Nate, I see Bruce's hand. Bruce, yes. do you have a question on this page? Uh, yes, th th thanks. Uh, Nate, um, I noticed the change for 200 patrons and that seemed to be uh, um, uh, you know that 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 is heading in the direction that I was advocating last time, of course. But I hadn't noticed the difference between occupancy and patrons before. So I, just because we were using Johnny's as a right. benchmark before, do you happen to know how many patrons 
uh, which is to say patrons and not cooks and cleaning staff and all those other folks that you mentioned uh, contribute to the occupancy. Do you know how many patrons uh, Johnny's hold? Uh, I, I don't, I think it'd still be close to 170. And so, you know, typically, um, you know, uh, they might have anywhere from five to say 15 staff on maybe, maybe more on a really busy night if there's a function, but, you know, because they have a bar, they can have people standing. And so, you know, it's a, it's a fluctuating number. So, yeah. you know, right now they're, whether the zoning bylaw and a, a permit said that they get up to 200 patrons, their occupant capacity based on other codes may, may not allow that, right? So um, if their okay. occupant capacity is 175, that's total. And then their patrons is, you know, they may keep it at 150 just to be clear, you know, depending on how many staff they have. Okay, that's, uh, that's, that's, that's good. I just wanted to check my reference. I, 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 I... I obviously support the, the di diminishment of number. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Bruce. Janet? Um, I, you know, I, I appreciate the clarity with adding the different like um, application requirements and standards and the clarity about, you know, saying no alcohol served after one o'clock. But the more I look at this sec section, the more I'm just puzzled why it's in the use chart. Um, because, you know, to me, the use chart is, you know, what's your activity? What zoning district is it in? What kind of permit do you need to get? Or are you allowed to do it? And so, you know, I wondered if this should be pulled out into regulations, like the planning board and the ZBA could adopt regulations that say, you know, when you're applying for a permit for a bar, restaurant, or a nightclub, you know, you need, you know, uh, manage it plan that you know x y and z um you know to make sure clouds get you know they don't they don't queue up too much and whatever so i just feel like this is just not in the right spot and if it was a regulation of the planning board and the zba we could sort of change it without having i think without having going through town council and so to me like half of these things look like things that you want to see in the application and the management plan and half of them are standards like you know use tableware that's reusable, you know, um, and things like that. So I just think this is just makes the use table really complicated and really confusing. And so if I was an applicant, I would, you know, go to my use table, all these conditions and management plan and application requirements are here. But then also I have a zoning bylaw that I have to look at. And then I also have a building code. And it just seems like, is there a way to simplify this process and the rules and the regs and you know what we're going to expect for conditions for applicants, but not in this use chart. All right, thanks, Janet. Nate, do you have any thoughts about that? <clears throat> yeah, I mean, so the use chart has always had a, a, a place where the, the categories are, um, classifications are listed and then there's standards and conditions here in this space. And so, you know, for marijuana establishments, we have, you know, more, we have like pages of standards and conditions. And so, the benefit of having it in a zoning bylaw is the building commissioner as the zoning enforcement officer and you know other boards and committees regulatory boards and committees can apply them if they're in planning board rules and regulations it may not be the case that the building commissioner could use these during administrative approval to have an applicant complete all these necessary steps and so you know the building commissioner of massachusetts is the zoning enforcement officer you know by by you know it's a statutory requirement so any building commissioner needs to enforce the zoning bylaw. And so that's why they're here, right? They become, we find that they're upfront here. I mean, I don't find that it complicates the zoning bylaw any more than a zoning bylaw is already complicated. And so to have these upfront is, um, you know, we find it to be a benefit to applicants and architects that this is what they're required to do. And this is what will, you know, generate conditions and enforcement actions by, you know, regulatory boards and the building commissioner. So. I mean, <clears throat> sure, some of the reasons why these are somewhat generic and not so prescriptive is that to change them would require changing the zoning bylaw. So, you know, in the management plan, we say in any other requested information, it's not an exhaustive list. And really, these are things that we're expecting an applicant to provide. We're not saying exactly what their floor plan has to look like. We're just saying that they have to provide a floor plan, 
right? There's more information in the rules and regs in terms of if we want to say what exactly the scale needs to be or the size of the sheet, but we're saying they need to provide these things. And so in, in our, you know, from staff's perspective, these are uh, reasonable to have in the zoning bylaw. I mean, we've already had this in the BN district down here, which gets pretty detailed. Um, so the rest of these are, um, you know, we find that they're, they're useful, especially because then they can be applied by the building commissioner. All right, thanks, Nate. Andrew. Thanks, Doug. Thanks, Nate. Um, my, my questions are pretty quick. Uh, on five, I'm not sure what, it, what you mean by patrons leaving the establishment, just the way that's worded there. The, the strategy for patrons leaving the establishment. Yeah, I mean, so like at closing time, if there's a you know if there's a number of people, what is how would they uh, close down? Sometimes you might have you know staggered leaving times, or you might actually have patrons? someone on the sidewalk, a staff person on the sidewalk managing the crowd as they leave the establishment. So, um, you know, we found that uh, it's really. You know how many? Excuse me. How many people are in the establishment, and then do they just usher them out in two minutes, and a hundred people have to leave, or you know, do they have stagger times and uh, slowly let people out single file with you know a staff person there, or with you know other things to direct traffic to a certain way? And this okay. this, this this was in response to some concerns, I think, in CRC from you know that 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 at closing time the neighborhood the neighbors might be disturbed. Right. And so, you know, what's happened um, in some instances, uh, we've asked that they, you know, put more plantings in or actually have a fence up just so that during, you know, when they, when patrons leave at night, you know, they can't go a certain way or it helps to, to mitigate some noise. And so, you know, we're not proposing specific, you know, strategies there, or, you know, means and methods. We're saying you have, you have to tell us applicant what, what you're going to do to do that. It, may, it makes sense. I think it just reads a little weird sort of yeah as is. so i don't know maybe a way to tweak that and then also i'm just wondering whether um when you know we're using strategies but are we really talking tactics like we want to have more concrete how we're going to do this stuff not just what if that right maybe so like what are what are the tactics management plans i mean it's already a management plan so, yeah, well, I guess when you talk about specific management strategies for alcohol and strategies to screen filter, is it more we want to have explicit tactics? Like that's what we're looking for? It's a question. Yeah, I mean, I think I think by having this in there, we we you know get the same type of response, whether we call it strategies or tactics or you know any something else. I uh, you know this be these become fields in an application in the management plan application that need to be completed. Um, okay, thanks. Hey, Nate, uh, one thing I've been sort of wondering about was it seems like when you talk about the different categories of restaurant, mm -hmm. or particularly the bars, bars with food or bars with no food, when we get to that kind of conversation, you say, well, it's not really about whether they give out peanuts, it's about whether the kitchen is operating or whether right. they have a kitchen. Right. And that kind of makes me wonder whether it ought to just be bar with operating kitchen or bar without operating kitchen. Is that really what you mean? No. So, you know, a, well, we have a definition for what a bar is in the bylaw. So it's a place where, you know, the alcohol consumption and service is the primary function and food may be incidental. So, you can have a, you know, there can be many restaurants that have a bar, but their primary purpose, say, during most of their operating hours is food service, right? They have, they have people seated and they have the kitchen operating. And they could, at some point, transition to a bar with no food served, right? So it's not, so they could be a bar, they could be a restaurant. Um, and so it's not that the kitchen is or isn't operating, it's really what becomes their primary function, and right? So, um I think if we had the categories you had, Doug, I think almost every establishment might have to get two permits then to operate because they would either be one or the other. And we're saying in the in the proposed first category, a restaurant, cafe, or a bar with food, that you could be both. If at some point you want to be a bar with no food, you then go to the second category, which requires a special permit. So okay, all right, uh, Janet. So. Basically, I think that you could 
you know, just to make it easier, I think for everybody to have an application for a bar, restaurant, nightclub, in restaurant that lists all the requirements, like we need a floor plan. And so I think it'd be easier if you had a specific application for this kind of thing. And so the applicant's like, oh, I have to fill out all these things. You know, we have a very general um, application. And then I do think it'd be better if we had inside the bylaw, the standards and requirements. So I just, I think it'd be easier, but pushing that aside, I have one very quick comment is, can a bar with food just have like sandwiches and kind of cold food? Is that, would that be a bar with food? Uh, it depends. So is it, you know, are they, is it prepackaged or how is it prepared? So, you know, it gets down to that kind of sometimes that level of detail in terms of food preparation. So if a bar has prepackaged food, that's just considered a bar with no food. Okay. So, so it could be like cold food, but it has to be chopped up. So the other, the other issue that really just gets, I think is super important. And I, I, I don't want to go through all my, my entire memo is that I think that, you know, is last call. So I think a bar that serves food and a restaurant that serves alcohol, if they're staying open to like one or two in the morning, they're mostly probably serving just alcohol. Right. And so last call is very impactful on neighborhoods. And so I am struggling why that uh, somebody who wants to serve after 1130 alcohol doesn't have to get a special permit. And I think that, I think that nighttime activity of leaving, a, you know, a place you've been drinking, especially in a college town is much more impactful, I think, than just having a restaurant, you know, bigger than Johnny's. And so I really do think that we need to continue special permit for last call. If we're extending the hours to last call, we need greater protections with the special permit. There's a lot, it's a little stricter in the beginning, gives you more, excuse me, um, you know, ways to say no or requirements, but also it has notice, a public hearing, notice to abutters, a chance for people to come in and talk to the ZBA and talk about their concerns. And so I think that's, I think that we've, we are losing that by allowing people to extend their hours past 11.30, um, people drinking and then leaving. And I think that 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 behavior of people leaving bars or bar restaurants or restaurants that have alcohol is gonna be particularly impactful in our many village centers that aren't used to this kind of activity. All right, thanks, Janet. All right. Uh, yeah, well, just quickly, I think that a bar with no food is a special permit. So if there's a restaurant that at some point ceases its operation of food service, it becomes a bar with no food served and that needs a special permit. And so that would require a public hearing. Um, additionally, and any establishment that is serving alcohol has to go through the Board of Licensing Commissioners. And if they want to extend their hours to serve alcohol later, that's a required, it's a required public hearing with notice to abutters, just like a site plan review or a special permit. And so <clears throat> anytime there's a change to the alcohol service, the Amherst Board of License Commissioners will hold a public hearing with notice in the paper and abutters, and they can place conditions on an establishment in terms of uh, things related to alcohol service. It also, the fire chief and police have to approve uh, and sign off on an application for changes to alcohol service. So, you know, when, uh, staff met with some, you know, with Janet Keller and Pam Rooney today, and they had some similar concerns. But what we explained is that 1130 is really an arbitrary number, and it's not as impactful as the operation and the management of an establishment. So <clears throat> with the standards and conditions we're proposing one through 11, it gets at how we can manage people leaving or how things are noises are mitigated. It's not necessarily the hour of 1130. It's really, you know, it could be 10 o'clock and it could be poorly managed. It's really how do we have conditions and safeguards um, that can be applied uh, with, you know, to an establishment? So it's really not the hours of operation. Um, also quickly, an administrative approval has taken, you know, 20 years of permit conditions and generated, uh, you know, this list right here. So during the use of Article 14, almost 20 restaurants have been permitted through Article 14. <clears throat> and there's been some public hearings uh, there's been no complaints. Uh, there's been, you know, typically when, like we said, when a restaurant comes in, they're, they go into class one and then they shortly after go to class two. And in the last so many years, 
Uh, you know, Rob Moore has said that not one resident has come to a public hearing when a restaurant goes from a class one to a class two to extend alcohol hours to 1 a.m. Sure. No one ever comes, even though the abutters have been noticed. And so with administrative approval, you know, what Janet's saying is right, that if a restaurant is already established and there's no changes, it may be able to extend alcohol service or certain parts of the business with administrative approval. However, administrative approval still requires all these conditions to be met. And it's more flexible than a special permit because the building commissioner can open up their, um, their administrative approval and possibly revoke it if the conditions aren't being followed. Once a special permit is issued and conditions are, are laid out and the special permit is finalized and say they're operating according to the special permit, but there's still a lot of complaints, it's almost impossible to go back and tell the owner they have to do something differently if they're meeting the conditions in a special permit. So, uh, you know, administrative approval with the building commissioner having a written decision that's at their will is actually more flexible and provides more opportunity for follow up than a special permit. You know, a special permit only has a 20 day appeal period. So, um, you know, once a special permit or a site plan review is granted with conditions, if, if we don't have the right condition in terms of how to manage patrons leaving the establishment, it's hard to change that unless it's, you know, there's something that they're doing uh, different in terms of their permit. Uh, so, you know, we, we actually think that administrative approval has worked really well in the last two years and it hasn't, you know, there hasn't been any issues. Um, right. I have a Thanks, oh, Janet. I have a quick question. So Nate, um, I'm not that familiar with the board of licensing because I think it was different under um, the olden days. So if I was gonna open a bar restaurant and I was coming in, I want to be open to like one in the morning or two. I, that would be site plan review, but would that still always that, you know, I'm a new place. I want to stay open late. I'm on site plan review. Would I still have to go in front of the board of licensing for that? Yes. <clears throat> okay. Any, any time. So, and they have to go through the board of health uh, typically too, if they're a restaurant or serving food. So, um, you know, any new construction or new, you know, so if there's a new expansion or new construction, it will always trigger a hearing. You know, I was, as we've mentioned, there's administrative approval if there aren't many changes to the exterior, right, in, in the section 11. Uh, but even if there's administrative approval, they still have to go through a public hearing with the Board of License Commissioners, so. All right, thank you, Nate. All right, I don't see any more board hands at this point. Uh, public attendees are, uh, do you, does anyone in the public want to make any comments at this time? I see four attendees. Uh, I see Pam Rooney's hand, if we can bring her over. Pam, please give us your name and your address. Hi, it's Pam Rooney, Cottage Street. I have a related a uh, question, it is not germane to specifically uh, the changes that are being made. And that is um, in, in the uh, Article 5, do the proposed changes actually allow us to handle pop-up events? I see, you know, we, we talk about uh, uh, accessory uses of, of outdoor dining and or music, but is, is this going to help in the arena of pop-up events. Nate? Yeah, so <clears throat> it depends. Um, you know, if there's a one-time event, that's considered a temporary event typically, and that doesn't address that. You know, an accessory use would be something that may happen periodically or with some frequency, whether that's, you know, a number of events in a short time frame or, you know, once a month, but every, every, you know, once a month, but continuously for, you know, every month. And so that becomes an accessory use. So the changes we're proposing in Article 5, do, they don't address temporary uses. I will say that currently staff has a technical assistance grant with the Pioneer Valley Planning Commission, and we've been investigating, uh, you know, other bylaws and coming up with a draft bylaw for temporary uses. Uh, it's not ready yet, but probably in the next few months, it'll be ready to be reviewed. And so, yeah, right now the bylaw doesn't have a mechanism for temporary events. And so when that moves forward, we may change accessory as well, because, you know, some people may assume accessory means temporary, but we're going to have them be two different things um, just to allow for different permitting. All right. 
Thanks, Nate. All right. Um, so I guess at this point, um, seems like we've gone through everyone's comments. And Nate, are you looking for a recommendation from the board to these changes? Right. And so, you know, town council has referred this and it's, you know, the, the CRC has kept their hearing open, their meeting tomorrow night. And so right. at this point it would be, you know, a recommendation on those changes. So, you know, we have the revised use table and then we have the changes to article five, 11 and 12. And so it'd be a recommendation on, on those. Yes. Okay. So would anybody uh, like to make that motion? Uh, I see Bruce's hand first. Yes, uh, that's what my intent was. Uh, so I was going to try and frame the motion, but uh, if I can say so moved and Pam understands what that is or she does, so so moved. Okay. All right. And, and uh, I should say, uh, I really appreciate the uh, effort that uh, the staff, particularly you, Nate, to put into this. And I, I've just watched you also on the CRC meeting the other night. I thought that was, that was very helpful to my understanding uh, in addition to what we had last time. So uh, I really applaud the uh, diligence that you've applied to this uh, exercise. Okay, thank you, Bruce. Uh, Janet, you got your hand up next. Um, can, are we gonna, I think we should go article by article, not like the whole kahuna. Uh, I guess Whatever that you, means. Nate, do you think we can do a, this as a single motion or do we need to go through the, them individually? I mean, it could be, Either one, I guess it depends on how board members feel if they want to, you know, um, have specific comments to some of the articles or if it could be addressed as one one vote. Okay. And Bruce, do I understand your motion was for all the changes for all, all of the bylaws in one vote? Uh, yes, I think we can do it in one. I think we've reviewed it fairly thoroughly and I'm comfortable with uh, that I, I understand everything that I need to understand uh, from A to Z and I'm happy to do it in one hit, but okay. we'll see whether that works. Okay, thank you, Tom. I second that. Thank you, Tom. Okay, uh, board members, uh, we've got a motion on the floor. We've had a fair amount of discussion. Do we want to have any more discussion before we go through a roll call vote? I do not see any hands. Uh, so uh, Chris and, and Pam, are you clear that this is a, a, a motion to amend Article 3, Article 5, Article 11, and Article 12 as proposed? As Mm -hmm. All right, uh, Janet. So I, I just need help. So I'm fine with Article 11. I'm far, fine with Article 12. I'm kind of rolling along with the use table. I'm not fine with Article 5. And so how do I vote? Do you know? I... Well, you can oppose. Uh, do you have questions for Nate about Article 5? Um, well, we, what you what know, is I... it you don't understand? It's not that I, I just don't support the, you know, half the changes in Article 5 I'm fine with, the other half I'm not. And so I don't want to vote against Article 12 and 11 and 3 when, do you know what I mean? And so it just puts me in an awkward spot. Uh, okay. But, you know, I mean, if you want to do it all up and down, I, when, you know, I don't want to be seen opposing things I support, if that makes sense. But they are, it is an interrelated package, though. I mean, I would hate for us to vote approve the changes to three of them and not the fourth. Uh, Doug, if I may. Yes, Bruce. Um, uh, I th I, whenever I've been chair of things like this, I've always appreciated the unanimous vote when I can get it. Um, it seems to me that if I were to amend the motion to exclude for the moment Article 5, but everything else, we might get a unanimous vote and then we can have a second motion to approve article five which i think yeah i guess i guess at the moment i guess i need to talk to, ask nate uh you know is there is does it work if we break it apart and have separate votes well i i, I guess the question would be it would i guess the question would be as part of the discussion with the motion 
you know, what are the changes or the questions uh, related to Article 5? So yeah, I why don't we just go through that? Uh, Janet, what is it? What are the objections you have? So I, I still don't understand why um, in Article 5, we're adding um, every possible use in the use chart to seasonal outdoor dining and pre-recorded entertainment. And so I just, I don't see, I think the, you know, it makes sense that it, those things should be always related to food. And I think if you want to be able to do temporary uses for outdoor dining or a pop-up or trucks or, you know, a music festival, I feel like we need to get, we need to give the building commissioner the authority to do that. And I don't think that, I'm sorry, I, but it seems like it's not that you don't understand, it's that you're not comfortable with this potentially happening for any of any use. Yeah, it's just this huge expansion that I just don't know, I just don't understand what circumstances it would come up that we'd have outdoor dining with a gas station or like why, what are some examples where this has come to the building commissioner or the planning department where somebody wants to do music with shoe shopping? Okay, uh, let's see. I mean, I think I know we talked about this in the last meeting. Nate, is there anything new you want to say? No, I, I think that um, right. So what we're proposing here is there originally there's you know these three, uh, well more than three. I list a number of things. It's more like you know a dozen where outdoor dining could be an accessory use. I think in the bylaw we say that accessory has to be you know related to the principal use. Um, and, you know, and this is only section five point zero four that's visible here. Uh, and it has to be common, you know, within the region in Hampshire County. Um, so, you know, our thought is that we can't, you know, there could be some business opportunities or things that we're not thinking of right now. And so why limit them? Because some, you know, someone couldn't come in and just say, oh yeah, when my business is closed, I'm going to do outdoor dining. Really the business has to be open and the outdoor dining has to be accessory to uh, the, the use that, you know, the principal business use, retail use. And so it can't be that, they think that, you know, like Xana couldn't say, oh yeah, in my parking lot after hours, I'm gonna start doing outdoor dining. That's actually a second principal use and now it'd have to go through permitting. It wouldn't be considered accessory. And so, you know, without trying to be exhaustive in, in terms of a list like we have now, we're just saying any principal use. Um, you, know, I, you know, it may seem strange, but, you know, that also means they have to have a kitchen and have a board of health uh, permit and review. So it's not taken lightly. It's not as if an establishment will just all of a sudden try to have outdoor dining and, you know, buy food, you know, buy sandwiches at Stop and Shop and then sell them over their counter, right? It's going to take, you know, licensing and permitting through the Board of Health and other um, boards and committees in town to make this happen. So we don't, you know, we don't think that there's going to be some kind of, you know, necessarily unintended consequence. It's still going to be reviewed thoroughly. So it still requires a special permit or a site plan review according to how the principal use is, is permitted. So if it's a special permit use, the accessory use, whether it's outdoor dining or music has to be a special permit hearing to allow that accessory use to happen. So, you know, it may seem strange like, oh yeah, why are we saying to any principal use? But, you know, it could be that, you know, a gas station could serve food, right? You know, now gas stations have Starbucks in them or, you know, Cumberland Farms is an example now where it's a gas station and a, a store. And so we're not, you know, we may not know how, um, a retail store could combine, you know, outdoor dining. Okay, thank you, Nate. Um, Tom? Yeah, I just wanted to um, clarify that this is a recommendation to the CRC, right? This is not necessarily an approval by us. Um, no, to, this is a recommendation to town council. Yeah, so, okay. You know, then they would have, you know, their, um, you know, then they would take it up as, a, you know, um, for, you know, the CRC would have to also recommend it, but then it becomes, um, you know, a zoning amendment that's being reviewed by town council. Right, but we're not, we're in this group, we're not approving, we're recommending. Just clarifying the language. Yes. Yeah. Right. Okay. We're, we're a you. recommendation. Uh, Janet, your hand is up again. So Nate, I guess what I, I think you're saying is the excess, it has to be an accessory, a traditional accessory use to a principal use. And in, and so that limits how expansive this is. 
When I think if you just wanted to limit it to food and drink establishments, you can get rid of all that list. If it's traditional to have outdoor dining, seasonal outdoor dining with food and drink establishments, why don't we just say that? Um, Because I I, kind of think you can't argue that, oh, this is, you know, outdoor dining is an accessory use to the principal use of a food and drink establishment. So don't worry, it's not going to expand. And then argue, oh, it's fine if it expands somewhere for some reason. And so I, I feel like there's just not a lot of vetting about what that could mean and implications. So that's, that's all right. Well, I, I, it does sound like you are more concerned about it than staff as it being a problem. Uh, Chris. Uh, I think that we discussed this internally and, and we also wanted to allow for uses like bakeries and delis and places like that, which are really retail stores, to be able to have outdoor dining if what they're selling could be eaten outdoors, you know, at a table. And so, you know, we didn't want to limit it from that point of view and just have it be um, available to food and drink establishments. Because um, I think it's, you know, it's clear that we can imagine other places that have kitchens that could do outdoor dining that wouldn't necessarily be restaurants. All right, thank you. Okay, um, don't see any more hands. We have a motion on the floor. Um, all right, are we get ready to go through a roll call vote? Um, yes, Bruce. Uh, do we have a second? Yes, we do. Tom Long. Okay, thank you. Yes. And then it's all all the zoning amendments. Yes, all the this is a pack. Oh. This is a vote on the entire package. So if you object to any part of it, you can vote against it. Okay, so we'll go through uh, roll call vote, starting with Bruce. Uh, in this uh, uh, a yes vote is in, is to recommend to town council this package of changes to the bylaw all related to food and drink establishments as well as the other articles three article five article 11 and article 12. i vote yes all right tom hi andrew hi janet abstain Okay, Johanna? Aye. And do we have Karen? Karen is at her reading. So Karen is absent. And I'm an aye as well. The motion carries five in favor, one abstention and one absence. Janet. So I know you're probably tired of hearing me on this, but um, on, this, on this matter, I would like, um, you know, I feel it an awkward stance because I actually am fine with several of these articles, but I would like that when we do the planning board report, that the pros and cons and the issues that I've raised or others have raised be incorporated into that. So um, so I, hopefully that will come out like faster and not at the last minute, but I have written quite a bit on this, so you could just cut and paste, but I do think um, it'd be good to get a kind of what what are possible negative consequences or different paths or problems that people see. So thank you. All right. And Chris, is it right that that, that report is usually probably composed in parallel or borrows from the minutes? Yeah, I, I see her nodding yes, her head. Yes, that's right. It is true that it um, Yeah. So I think, so like I think minutes, if, yeah. if we may want to look at the minutes next meeting and see how you've recorded it. Mm -hmm. and if some of Janet's uh, concerns have been mentioned. Mm -hmm. All right, okay. thank you all. So the time now is 7.22 and we can go on to our next item on the agenda, item four, which is a public hearing for a site plan review. Let's see. All right, so this public hearing is, is held in accordance with the provisions of Mass General Law Chapter 40A. Actually, I'll just say, did I say it was 722? Yes. Uh, okay. 
This joint public hearing has been duly advertised and notice thereof has been posted and is being held for the purpose of providing the opportunity for interested citizens to be heard regarding SPR 2023-01 and SPP 2023-01 Archipelago Investments LLC 47 Olympia Drive. This uh, hearing is being continued from August 3rd, September 7th, September 21st, October 19th, and November 2nd. It's a joint public hearing to request site plan review approval under section 3.326 of the zoning bylaw to construct a private apartment style dormitory with 68 dwelling units and associated interior and exterior spaces and associated site improvements including waiver of on-site parking requirements and a special permit to modify maximum building coverage and height requirements under section six, table three, footnote A of the zoning bylaw, map 8D, parcel 18 in the RF zoning district. All right, are there any board member disclosures? All right, I don't see any. Um, Chris, do you want to be start as the applicant tonight? I, I just wanted to um, mention, um, I had sent an email to Doug earlier today, um, based on a conversation I had with Kyle, and also based on um, some information I got from the, from Aaron Jacques, the wetlands administrator. And um, so this project for 47 Olympia Place is still um, being heard by the Conservation Commission, and the Conservation Commission has a few items that they need to have resolved before they can close their public hearing and issue their um, order of conditions. And <clears throat> the next time that the Conservation Commission will be hearing this case is December 14th. So I'm going to recommend that um, the Planning Board hear from uh, Kyle Wilson. He's the propose the proposal the proponent should say, and um, that you have a discussion. And then if you feel comfortable with this, um, go through the findings and conditions that we've sent you and, um, you know, kind of get as far as you can with this and then uh, continue your public hearing to your meeting on December 21st, which is after the Conservation Commission will have presumably closed its public hearing and made its decision. And, um, and that's that's our recommendation. Thank okay. you. All right. Uh, welcome, Kyle Wilson. Good evening. Welcome back, I guess I'd say. Hmm. And Thank you. So would you like to make uh, any sort of presentation this evening? Uh, I'd just like to follow up with what Chris said. And uh, we are before the Conservation Commission uh, all the substantial issues have been addressed relative to stormwater and uh, infiltration and under uh, retainage and so on. Uh, the two remaining items are a wetlands mitigation fee or a buffer in our case, a buffer mitigation fee. Uh, it's one, it's a new item um, in the bylaw that came in in uh, June uh, that we're uh, looking to uh, resolve and also something that we could discuss today, but the they're looking for something that states that we have the uh, the right to tie into the existing storm sewer that exists on site. So other than that, all the items have been addressed uh, with CONCOM um, and we'll be back before them, as Chris said, on the 14th. Uh, what we wanted to, relative to the planning board, there were uh, the bicycle storage was an item that we've worked on. Um, we're looking at covering the bicycle storage on the north. Um, that would not impact our uh, conservation commission or our infiltration or stormwater or coverage or anything uh, of that sort. Um, it's uh, more of a design detail that we're working with uh, with the architects. Um, it would also impact our exterior um, lighting plan for our photometric plan. So I think what we'd be submitting to you um, following this meeting and in advance of the 21st would be some details on that uh, fencing and covered bike storage that would include a uh, updated photometric plan. Uh, uh, Kyle, would that also affect your lot coverage by, by additional no. coverage? No, that's that's as as it has been submitted and as has been presented and accepted by the Conservation Commission. None of that changes. It's just in that 
concrete pad, uh, we would look to cover uh, the bike storage. Okay. All right. Um, Chris. That's an interesting question, and I think we could take advantage of. Is Rob Morris still here? Yeah, I see his his square. Yes. Um, I think we might want to clarify that with Rob Mora that the um, coverage of bike storage would not be considered building coverage. And perhaps Rob could be um, asked to answer that question. Rob? Yeah, that, that's correct. It would not be uh, considered building coverage because it's open. Uh, the sidewalls are open. So just the covering itself would um, add to lot coverage, not building coverage. Thank you. Okay. Right. Because we do have. Um, a special permit being requested for building right. coverage. Thank you. Yeah, and we're, I guess we're right at 45.35%. We're a little bit over. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Chris, you're, okay, your hand is down now. All right. Uh, so Kyle, there really isn't anything you want to update us on and there's no materials you want to show us? Nothing in addition to what we've already presented, but I could share, you know, re, re show anything that anybody wanted to see. Okay. So you have it available if we want to look at it. Sure. Okay. Board members, uh, I guess now is the time to continue our conversation about this project. Um, are there any topics that people want to talk about? Bruce? Finding my unmute button. Um, yes, uh, I, I wanted to go over my concerns about the parking, uh, Kyle. I, I asked you some questions about this last time. And as I recall, essentially, you were saying uh, that you wanted to trust in the UMass parking uh, system to uh, solve uh, the parking problem. And um, I'm going to turn my light on because I've got some notes that I want to read or make sure I cover properly and, and succinctly. Doug, I sent this email to you, so you at least know what I'm thinking here. Excuse me a moment. Um, so, uh, um, basically, uh, uh, Kyle, I, I, I'm not sure that I'm ready to trust uh, that the UMass parking uh, uh, will satisfy the problem because there's, there's no guarantee that you say that the deed uh, entitlements will be ratified. And we've just, uh, again, in the last day or two, had another email from the university, which is uh, confirming that they're again, uh, for a year, two years in a row, have been oversubscribed to uh, the total number of parking lots. Is that not correct, Doug? I, I don't believe so. Chris, did I misunderstand I think, the email? I think the recent email from Nancy, I don't think it said they were oversubscribed. So there was a late breaking bit of news, um, which is an, a second email from Nancy Buffon. The first email was one that was issued in August in response to a question I had asked. And she reported on past years of um, parking lots being uh, full. Um, and then uh, I asked her again, because I wanted, I wanted to know, has anything changed and she responded today saying this year there are available permits for lot 13. Um, she can't say that those will be surplus every year, but they are surplus this year. Um, any UMass student can apply for a parking permit, et cetera. So you can read the email here. So this is the latest information from Nancy Buffone. I also sent you a plan that Kyle had submitted previously and you had received previously showing where lot 13 is. So the lots up in this um, neck of the woods are lot 13 and lot 24. Lot 24 is kind of smaller and it's closer to um, the building that's being proposed. Lot 13 is more um, distant from the building, but it's very much larger. So I don't know if we wanna show that um, plan if Pam has access to that. I think it's up there. I see it. I, I do not see a plan. I see Nancy's uh, email. email. All right, let's see, new chair. 
It was a separate document. I, I guess I can also comment uh, anecdotally. Uh, what I've heard at the university is that um, there's not a problem with parking this year and that it was during the pandemic when people weren't sure how, how long they'd be allowed to be on campus that there was a greater number of cars. Um, Chris, your hand is still up. Did you oh, want sorry. to say anything else? No, no, this is just okay. the plan that I wanted to let you see where part where lot 13 is. Okay, great. All right, can, uh, Bruce. Can you see it now? Yes, we can. Okay. Yes, there are there are two lot 13s and there are two lot 24s. I and they're not connected, so I was I've been perpetually confused about that. But uh, but nonetheless, okay. So that email is uh, uh, an update on the email that I was working off, which was a day ago, which uh, wasn't so uh, optimistic. Um, it so so maybe we can trust uh this but i'm not sure uh that email makes me feel a little bit more comfortable but um uh, kyle i have two things to ask of you um the first is uh i mean we've got your previous project right next door which i guess is an exactly similar project uh, adjacent to exact same locations and so forth and we we've got a number of years of data let's say five um uh, i would feel comfortable if i knew what the uh parking demands of tenants in is it olympia oaks uh olympia oaks is the sort of affordable housing okay so it's 50 57 system. yeah okay so i would feel more comfortable if i if i could see the uh, parking demands of residents uh, over the past five years for uh, 57 because it's so similar i mean why wouldn't i not want to see that if i was being asked to trust that this system which if not maxed out uh, is close to it and uh, i uh, well i don't know that we should be confident that uh, we can uh, for the life of this building expect that the uh, parking um that the leaving this to the discretion to, to the uh, essentially where 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 we got to trust that the residents of this building will prevail in a competition for parking permits and that doesn't feel to me uh, to be a very uh, responsible position for us to okay. I would be more comfortable if I could see that the adjacent uh, project has been, uh, that, that has worked for five years. I also uh, wanted to, uh, and I'll ask this question now too, because in, in the event that, that, that uh, getting data for 57 is either too difficult or it doesn't pan out or what have you, um, is there not a way in which you could come to some arrangement with the university where you would offer to expand some of the parking? I don't know how fully developed that uh, stuff is. It's, uh, it seems to be roughly paved or hardly even paved, and maybe it could be made bigger and more spaces could be created if it were laid out better. Um, and if not, uh, certainly the, uh, this, this parking that's provided could be better provided by paving and doing some other upgrades, lining and so forth, and whether um, a reasonable accommodation with the university where you would commit to do some portion of uh, parking enhancement over their uh, area in exchange for them uh, honoring the uh, deeded entitlements. Would you be, would you be prepared to uh, take that up with the university? Uh, Mr. Wilson, any response? uh we have uh last we we met we discussed uh we've tried to get a sense of uh the folks that have parking permits that live at 57 olympia and have discussed that that's somewhat difficult because when if someone purchases a parking permit from umass they are not required to use their 57 olympia address it can be uh an, a home address uh so that information has a lot of noise to it um we're seeking a parking waiver um we're seeking that waiver because we think that this site is best utilized for housing and for optimizing the housing and the value of the housing and the 
the taxable value of the housing on this one acre site. Uh, the site next door was approved as, as the model for this very unique location in Amherst uh, that we're looking to uh, further develop. Um, I think that the, you know, we've discussed with, uh, with UMass improving uh, the, the spaces across from Mather Drive for uh, the drop-off and for visitors and for connecting to utilities. Uh, I think conversations beyond that um, are relative to the folks that have those deeded rights that, that, uh, that exist uh, for uh, our two parcels and the other 10 parcels that are owned through the Commonwealth through various uh, ways. So I think that um, what we're seeking is is to continue what is obviously working next door, um, and um, and that's why we're seeking the parking uh, parking waiver. All right, thank you, Kyle. Um, Tom, you are uh, next. Uh, oh, uh, could I follow up? And uh, sure, sure, um, uh, Kyle, you said uh, that we should continue what's obviously working next door. And when I ask you for evidence that it's obviously working, you say you can't produce it because the reasons given. I mean, it just doesn't seem um, responsible for us to grant this parking waiver without at least some effort to uh, uh, secure the needed entitlements to parking that come with the site. I mean, surely you can understand that. Uh I don't think there's any disagreement as to whether or not we have deeded rights to, you know, the parcels that we have identified for parking and recreation. I think the question is to whether or not those parking spaces are sufficient uh, for this housing to be built. I think that if the housing next door had created a conflict relative to parking, we all would have heard about it. We all would have discussed it uh, at length. Um, it has not created a parking problem. It's doing quite well. It's paying a, a, a great deal of taxes. It's providing a lot of you know, very important housing. It is on a bus loop that's named after Olympia Drive that the majority of the residents use for their transportation. So I think it is clear that there is not a parking problem. I think that uh, we're looking to, uh, as I said, um, build another project that looks to be as successful as a project to the north. All right, thank you, Kyle. Um, Tom, you're next. Thanks, Doug, and thanks, Kyle. I mean, I, I have two comments. One, one is from, um, I think, uh, the perspective of a student and looking for housing. And if I have a car and I can't park it, or I'm having trouble getting a parking permit, I'm probably not going to rent that apartment. And I think the reality of the user situation is wherever I'm going, if I can't put my car there, I'm not gonna go there. Or if I have a lot that's across campus and I have to park there, that's what you get. We know people who work at UMass who have to park in a lot a, a mile from their office because that's the only lot that's available to them. And then they park there and they walk to theirs. That's what happens on the university. And I think, that's something we want to accept, that people are going to either have a car or not have a car or make decisions about where they want to live, but they're on campus and there's buses and there's bikes and there's ways to get to the places they want to be through the systems that exist. And second is that we've been asking or, or hearing from people for weeks and weeks and months, like, can we not put dorms downtown? And here we have an opportunity to not put dorms downtown and we're complaining about whether or not people can park there. Like these are not downtown dorms. These are the place where we want students to live in a vicinity of the campus where they can walk or take a very convenient bus named after the loop itself. Why are we actually trying to put roadblocks to, to something that I think is actually fruitful for all of the considerations that we've been talking about for so long? I just, I don't see it. I don't see a reason to try to put any roadblocks up for something that is going to be beneficial for UMass, beneficial for downtown, and beneficial for the students that make the right choice to live in a place that either has the parking they need or don't. 
but they'll find parking if they want it, if they have a car. Otherwise, they're going to move somewhere else, and that's their choice. So I, I just feel like this is this is a, a wonderful place to put housing, and we should try to limit the roadblocks that um, might get in the way of actually making this a reality. Thank you, Tom. Uh, I guess I'll just interject. I you've you've basically said the comments that I thought I might say. Um, you also are, are the only thing I would add is we all, there's already 13,000 students who move into a dorm without knowing whether they they will get a parking permit because they're all you know they're all just going to be going to be going down to parking and applying for a permit and so this just adds 400 or whatever 300 students to that pool that UMass has to uh, either satisfy or not. And some of the, you know, if they ever run out, some of the students are likely to be students that live here. And many of the students who don't get a parking permit are likely to live in UMass dorms because the UMass treats all the students who apply the same. So, uh, you know, I applaud, I think this is a perfect place to be building another essentially the dorm. It's already zoned for dorms. And uh, I agree with Tom. All right, Janet. So I come at this from a different perspective. And one of the things is, is I think we all want this project to go, right? Nice building, nice amenities, taxes for the town, you know, places for students to live um, with a, we have a very small, vacancy rate. I don't think people have that many options to pick and choose, but obviously whoever can afford this, you know, they have a place to live. So I think we're all trying to make it go, but I see my job and our job is enforcing the bylaw and the bylaw has parking requirements. And it's not really up to me to decide, you know, I don't know. I, don't, I never understand this board, like, you know, in one place we're requiring four spaces because there's four undergraduate students. We have three boarders. We want three spots for them. Here we have a building full of students and we're like, eh, they can find something. I just feel like it's, we're not freestyling here. We have a bylaw to implement and it requires either two sp parking spaces per unit or if we're considered a dorm, one per bed. So that's, that's what we're enforcing. But so I really do want this project to go. I just personally didn't, I logically do not understand somebody who says, I have deeded rights to parking at these lots all around here please give me a waiver. And so I just don't understand why the developer or whoever owns it, the only person who has literally the legal authority to assert this right is the person who owns the lot. And so I'm interested, Kyle, in your discussions with UMass, when you say I have deeded rights to parking in these lots, can I have a hundred spaces or 50 spaces, or I want these spaces. And when people apply to you, you know, let's agree you know, they get it, right? I mean, have you had those discussions and UMass says, no, you don't have the right? I mean, if you have a right to parking, oh, it seems like a no brainer. Just let's say, it, you know, we decided as a board, we look at our bylaw, we decide how many spaces are needed. You have deeded rights, you provide them to the tenants. So have you, I mean, I'm sorry to get a little hysterical here, but just like, have you talked to UMass and said, do you recognize my rights to this parking? We need X amount of spaces. You know, I think, you know, Bruce's idea about, you know, putting some pavement down, some striping, I would love to see some um, electric car chargers. You know, you could be a benefit both ways. I mean, have you talked to UMass and have they said no? Uh, Mr. Wilson? Uh, we have talked to UMass. They recognize our deeded rights uh, per the deed for parking and recreation. Uh, we have not discussed with them a exact number of parking spaces that we would need for these buildings that would usurp any other uh, folks who are looking to purchase permits for our lot 13 or 24. But we have empty spots. So can you have those discussions saying, here's what we think we need, you know, let's cap it at this. Because that would be really uh, we, helpful. We, we have, uh, we've, 
uh, our consideration of this has thought that it would it would very much complicate John King's efforts to effectively manage those lots uh, as best he can with all the the parking that they're trying to manage all over campus, and that would be a complication that wouldn't really uh, uh, benefit anyone involved. Uh, okay, so, so, so it sounds like he could have come to come to UMass with that demand i suppose i think i think as i've discussed on previous meetings we we've chosen to take a path that is currently working uh this is a gray area that is not black and white uh we don't look to impose our rights as two of the 12 uh as owners of two of the 12 parcels upon the other 10 parcels which obviously have not been developed and are in a future opportunity uh we've looked to continue to work in a collaborative fashion with umass they're getting the, uh, the permit fees, they're managing uh, the parking. It seems to be working well next door. We'd like to continue that. I think the imposition of a number of parking spaces that would be best guess, especially uh, before us right now for the future of this building, uh, as I said, seems to significantly complicate uh, a process that seems to be working just fine. All right, thanks, Kyle. Uh, Johanna. Thanks. Um, I'm thinking about this in the context of the town's climate and clean energy goals. And not only and thinking about it in that context drives me to agree with a lot of the things that Tom proposed. So we know that we need to reduce emissions, having highly efficient buildings that produce energy on site and that are all electric are a step in the right direction in terms of the type of housing we need to build. Um, this also has quite a bit of density of housing, which is consistent with our climate and clean energy goals. It will have sheltered bike parking, is on a bus loop, and you know, for ambitious students, they can even walk to campus from the site because it's just not that far. I think this is the perfect site where we would not require parking minimums. And when I look at the climate and clean energy leadership cities all across America, some of them are doing away with parking minimums because they recognize that we need to move away from making car ownership a default. Um, and yes, there are gonna be electric vehicles, but like in addition to transitioning to electric vehicles, we also need to create spaces for people to live where they drive less and can live more. And to me, this is a perfect opportunity to walk the walk on those principles in our town. All right, thank you, Johanna. Bruce? Um, well, I'm, I'm moved by what Tom said about if uh, the renter can't get a permit that may decide to decide to live elsewhere. So that's, uh, that's a compelling argument. I'm uh, respectful of Kyle's uh, statements rela relating to his confidence, uh, having discussed with the UMass parking director and, and trying not to make his life too complicated unnecessarily. And, that the, uh, and what you said, Kyle, about uh, 57, uh, working in a more global sense without having to uh, produce data to demonstrate it uh, piece by piece. Um, so, and I'm interested in your answer to Janet's question about the deeded rights and uh, to the extent that you pursued them. Um, so I'm thinking that my situation, I might be more comfortable than if, if I were to say, yes, I agree with Tom, I agree with and support uh, Kyle, Kyle's optimism, Kyle's experience, some combination of the two. But um, I guess the deeded rights are not going to go away. So if there was a problem in the future, um, I'm wondering whether uh, we could uh, frame a condition that would be acceptable to all that would say that if there is a problem, in other words, we can confidently kick the can down the road, perhaps knowing that if there was a problem, the condition that uh, uh, said that the, uh, the, the, uh, uh, the, the owner would uh, seek to exercise those deeded rights to gain preference um, uh, for the uh, 
some of those available spots. I, I'm not able to draft that condition in my head, but I am able to imagine the presence of a condition in our, uh, in our list of conditions that would speak to uh, an action that would uh, be pursued in the future if a problem arose with our having granted the parking waiver. Um, I, I guess I could ask that as a question of Chris. Uh, is she there? Yes. Uh, Christine, is, is, uh, or does anyone imagine that such a condition could be reasonably constructed? And I guess I should ask Carl whether, well, he might not be the owner. Uh, in, you know, it could, <laughs> could be a long way into the future. But I would feel comfortable if we, uh, if the record showed without having to do a search and having the, uh, having the institutional memory um, be so alive and well that it could do it without being uh, triggered by a condition. A condition would trigger the knowledge that there is a deeded right that has at the time of application for good reason not being pursued. But in the event of a problem related to students and, and so forth, uh, residents and parking, that, uh, that the uh, applicant be encouraged to pursue those needed entitlements. Uh, uh, Bruce, I guess I'm, I'm curious how anyone other than the owner of the building would know if there was a problem. Well, um, a... and, and it seems like the owner of the building, if they perceived it was a problem, might go back to UMass and say, you know, this has been working and, but it doesn't seem to be working as well or at all lately. And well, I think it's time for us to sort of rethink how we're jointly exercising our rights to park on those parcels. And I, I can see all that happening without any condition needed from us. Okay, yes, yes, I can see that too. That's, that's a good point. Um, because I was going to say, well, in an ordinary situation, the parking, the, the, the problem might be arised by Adam Butters complaining that uh, people are parking on their lawn, for example. But I agree with uh, uh, Tom that this is not a place where um, these kind of problems are going to manifest. Um, so uh, I'm going to, okay, that, that was helpful. Thank you all. All right, well, we'll continue the conversation. Janet. I, I'm actually interested in Bruce's idea. Um, so, um, so I think basically the way to set that up um, is to, to have whoever owns this building inform the tenants that they, you know, have X amount of spots per, per apartment or whatever unit or bed or whatever we decide is what's needed or required. And then the way they secure that is to apply to UMass. Um, and if the people can't get parking through UMass, they contact the building owner and let them kind of negotiate with John King and to say, well, you have empty spots. We have a right to deeded parking. This person didn't get it, you know, arrange it. So I think the only person that can enforce these deeded rights are the owners of the building. And, you know, I think they have to get more, you know, we can refer to that as a parking management plan. And the parking management plan is, you know, if 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 everybody at, you know, 4070 Olympia Place gets a space next year, we're all happy. In three years, that may not happen. UMass is growing. In five years, that may not happen. UMass might be growing, you know, but maybe people are going to a car-free existence or very wealthy people at this don't want to drive to Whole Foods or to Vermont or to visit their relatives, all those things that we do with our cars. Maybe people are using fewer or few cars. There's no evidence of that, but I just think we have to protect the interests of the tenants. You know, they need parking. If they need parking, they should get it. You know, um, we need to enforce the bylaw. And I think we could write a condition that basically puts the burden on the owner of the building to basically say, Everybody has a right to parking or X amount of spaces. And if you have any problem with UMass, come to us and we'll work it out for you. All right, thank you, Janet. Um, Chris, your hand is up. Yeah, I just wanted to point out that there is a possible condition in the draft conditions to deal with this. And it was a condition that we put on the um, 57 Olympia Place. And so this condition says, um, it's number four in the list of draft conditions, 
Parking for tenants at 47 Olympia Drive shall be provided as set forth in the management plan for 47 Olympia Drive. If the availability of parking for tenants changes from what is set forth in the management plan, the owner shall submit a new parking proposal to the planning board for its review and approval. So something like that could be um, imposed in this case. And the management plan that has been submitted, uh, I presume, simply says that the tenants are not guaranteed parking through the owner. They are expected to apply and take their chances with UMass. Is that right? That's correct. Yep. So that's how it's been working. Uh, Andrew. Thanks, Doug, and thanks, Kyle. Um, yeah, I, I I feel like this. So I, I hadn't really processed that um, the. Uh, condition you just mentioned, Chris, but I, I found myself originally um, agreeing with what Bruce was saying. And then as I thought about Doug, your comments and more, I feel like um, this this might be sort of self-corrective to a certain extent in that, you know, if people are not uh, comfortable in finding parking spaces, as Tom alluded to, they, they won't go there, right? Like Kyle will know there's a problem when he can't lease out his building right. or when people are coming to him and asking to break their lease. Um, he'll know, and it's in his interests as a business owner to, to, to rectify that situation. So it does feel like it could be self-corrective. Um, Janet, I, I really, I thought your comment about us not freestyling is great. Um, and I'm, I'm trying to be, um, I'm trying to, to respect that. I think that as I consider the facts presented, as I consider things relative to the, you know, our, our stance, um, on trying to improve the overall environmental conditions in the, in the town, um, I, I, I'm I'm quite comfortable with this. I think that again, if there's an issue, um, Kyle will be the first one to know, and and he is the one who is most he will be the the, the party that is kind of most interested in rectifying this for the the long term um, uh, success of this business. Thanks. All right. Thanks, Andrew. Uh, next, uh, Janet, do you have anything new to say? Um, could we pull up the section 7.9 of our bylaw that talks about waivers? And if we're going to talk about waiving it, let's just make sure we're applying the right standards. Well, I don't know that Pam has that uh, available to show on the screen. I can certainly turn to it as do you, is that... Uh, section yeah. a long section or should i read it it's it's just i wouldn't read it i would i would i'd pull it up or we should look at it before our next meeting because if we're going to waive it we need to waive it using the criteria i i really i understand and appreciate the environmental thing but i just think that we need to apply our bylaw to the situation and i you know i you know we live in a town with almost no vacancy and and this building will help. <laughs> no, but we're, you know, we're requiring a part. We require parking so inconsistently on this board. I can't figure out what our standard is. Less than one at one place, one per, one less than one per unit at, at you know, at Michi, um, one per bed up on College Avenue, one per bed at the boarding house. Um, I forgot what we did on Main Street or what we did. So. I just, you know, I think, I don't know, I, I, I support Bruce's condition, putting the burden on of parking on that. If we're going to waive it, we have to waive it under a legal standard that we are, as a board, upholding. That's, we're, we're enforcing the bylaw. I mean, so let's look at it, and we don't have to look at it now, but let's make sure the conditions are met. They talk about a management plan. They talk about peak uses. Um, if we were applying our new requirements, we might require shadow parking. No, no, I just let's just let us just enforce our bylaw. Okay. Uh, I guess we can come back to whether we want to go through that bylaw this evening. Bruce, um, uh, I think I would like to uh, just clarify one other thing related to the draft conditions. Uh, uh, Chris 
raised uh, condition number four, but uh, draft condition number five is uh, actually, I think, uh, more. Um, if we were to, uh, if we to, uh, were to approve it, it's five uh, B says information regarding parking, including a statement in the lease that students have responsibility for obtaining parking for their own vehicles and a rider in the lease regarding parking. Uh, which shall make, uh, uh, which shall contain the make and model of vehicle, vehicle registration, inform and information regarding the vehicle's owner's uh, permit to park a vehicle. Um, I, I guess, uh, I, I guess that's consistent with what we've been uh, uh, coming towards, which is uh, really I'm kind of uh, down to where uh, Andrew was saying. Uh, this is a, a self-correcting uh, uh, problem because I I've been persuaded I think uh, although I have spent a lot of time imagine not being able to imagine how I could be persuaded but I think uh, 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 Andrew and the rest of you finally got to me um, and I just want to make sure that if we uh, are going to have other conditions that have leases and so forth that uh, that uh, that that's consistent with uh, essentially a, a parking waiver. Uh, and I guess we should also, we, I guess we're, this is a parking waiver of, of all the parking, because of course waivers can be waiving half or a third or 10% or whatever. So this is a complete waiver we're talking about, I guess, because the total parking is intended therefore to be provided by the surrounding UMass and, and the obligation of the students to get uh, permits, but the lease is talking, seems to somehow, um, I guess it's just asking that permits were recorded. Uh, what I want to clarify is whether the intent of that condition, Chris, was to obligate tenants to get parking uh, permits if they have cars. Um, is that the intent of that uh, 5B? Chris? I think that's the intent. This was a condition that was imposed on 57 Olympia Drive, and I'm not sure what the outcome was because I don't remember having seen a lease and I don't remember having seen information about um, vehicles. So this is a condition that probably needs to be talked about with um, the building commissioner to determine whether it really is, um, whether it really makes sense. So, and I, haven't well, I wonder whether whether Tile can tell us how that condition has been implemented uh, in your leases. Do you have a writer to the lease that has the automobile information, or does the lease just say, you know, you have to go get a permit from UMass and you don't provide parking? Uh, that's a good question. I don't know. I don't. We don't have the information on the people that have. Uh, any parking permits through the university. So all that parking has gone through uh, UMass parking. Okay. All right. Uh, so Chris, uh, assuming we are continuing this hearing, uh, I guess I see Rob Morris still on the, on the call. Uh, were you saying we, you needed to check with Rob about, <clears throat> excuse me, about the I should check with Rob about the, the wording of this because I um, I don't think I've had a conversation with him about it. Rob, do you have a copy of the draft conditions? It, yeah, uh, uh, yes, I'm looking at it now. I, I guess you know that that condition, the way it's worded, reads to me that you know um, Kyle may be collecting the vehicle information from the from the tenant, but not necessarily whether or not they have obtained a permit. Um, I'm not sure if that does what the board uh, wanted in in the 57 application, but it doesn't it doesn't seem to get to the point about whether uh, the tenant actually has obtained a parking permit. So well, that condition probably needs to be reworded or yeah, I, I think if I yeah. were reading writing it, I would just delete everything starting with <clears throat> and a writer because that that information doesn't seem to be collected or really relevant to Kyle. Can we bring that um, condition up so that everybody can see it? 
Is that possible? It's in the draft possible conditions. I think so, Chris. Um, Doug, I have I could read out what's in the lease and the management plan if people want that information. Because it kind of there's a circle being kind of drawn. Uh well, I was hoping Pam could bring up the relevant. I'm trying. I'm trying to figure out how to get to my, hold on. Um, I don't have the zoning bylaw. I'm trying to get to the packet. So Nate. Yeah, we were looking for the draft conditions. Yeah. which I could get to earlier when I was practicing. Okay. All right, there's your, uh, I guess that's, what is that, Facebook or something? Uh, no, that's Teams, <laughs> Facebook. <laughs> Nate, can you get to the packet quick? I don't know why I'm struggling. Perfect, thank you. Okay. Yeah, here are the draft conditions. So we're looking at, you know, four and five. And, you know, I will say that we have the, it has been a condition before that, you know, and it says in the, in the parking section of the zoning bylaw that least restrictions on parking can be part of the parking management strategy. So, you know, if this condition reads that it's really, you know, that the lease will contain language that it's, you know, it's on the, the tenant to find permit parking through the university, then that, you know, that could be some of the reasons why the planning board would grant a waiver, right? So if, if that's where we're going, right, it's trying to craft this to read that way. Yeah, I just wonder, I think in the, on the second line of 5B, I You're think just, I would, I would just end the sentence at vehicles and right. delete, delete, delete all this. Of it. Yeah. But uh, met, that may just be me. Uh, I see three hands. Actually, Nate, uh, one of them is yours. Maybe that you're all set? Yeah, I'm all set. OK. Uh, Tom Long. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to decline right now because I, I had a comment about something way earlier so I'll, I'll come back to that okay andrew thanks again um so a uh, quick question um is what is the plan for handicapped residents kyle yeah there was a exhibit that was submitted last uh, meeting that shows uh, additional spaces being added to the existing handicapped spaces on the north side of Mather Drive. So just across from the entry to the building, we would uh, add additional parking handicapped spaces and short-term drop-off spaces. And that that's in the, that, the exhibit, the lot 13 and lot 24? In, uh, in sort of that's the, in the... <coughs> or in the lot 24? 1027. 33 spaces. That we, that we made. It's a, an exhibit from SBE. Parking and Mathers Drive Adjustment Exhibit. Okay, and how does that? I guess how does that relate to your your deeded rights here in agreement with UMass? That it's just that sort of. We're, a, we're doing that. That's that's one of the parcels that is included in the deeded rights for parking and recreation. So, uh, UMass was receptive to us uh, improving that. Okay, improving and and capturing spaces to to meet that need. Uh, just kind of uh, the existing spaces have been maintained closer to what used to be UMass admissions and then they kind of fall off in this corner. So improving that and making uh, making those handicapped spaces that connect across the street. Okay. Um, and how many spaces in total do you know offhand? Well, we're we're not changing the number of spaces there. There are yeah. in this in the lot just north of that there were approximately 30 spaces that were painted Chi Omega that had been used as Chi Omega uh, informally for 50 years. Uh, and we'd remove those and those would all go into either 13 or 24, uh, whatever you must saw appropriate. Thank you, Nathan. 
Yeah. So very sorry. I was just going through, I just, um, that's it. Yeah. Here's where the, you know, here's where the proposed parking would be, including, you know, um, that Kyle was just mentioning. Two space. Is that just two spaces? I it can't looks, tell. Yeah. It looks um, like two. And then there's an existing two on the left side of that same run. Yeah, farther down at the other end. So of that. All of those spaces are either handicap or uh, uh, visitor short term. All, all of them on that run but facing the uh, eight or nine spots. And, yeah, but but and, four dedicated yeah. handicapped. There's just four dedicated handicapped. Correct. All right. I guess how do you feel about that? <laughs> Relative to the number of new residents, that's that. I I I don't want to vary or go from what I mentioned before, but you know this is something that I just would love to have a, a little bit more clarity on. Is is uh, you know UMass was in was was comfortable with this agreement. Um, is four doesn't certainly seems like a pretty small number. Uh, Kyle, would it based on the way your the tenor of your conversations with UMass, if uh, if you discovered you had five handicapped people in your building and you needed a couple more signed as handicapped, do you think that would be a difficult thing to work out with UMass? Uh, I do not. No. Should we just ask for more now then? I, I think it's balancing the, the handicapped spaces and, and the, the 15 minute or the, you know, the quick uh, drop off spaces. And uh, we could absolutely discuss that that balance. Okay, I mean, I think that'd be great. Uh, get, there are a lot of a lot of folks here. Um, so, thanks. All right, uh, Janet. Um, I was wondering if if we could also um, have a requirement of adding some EV charging stations, but I also just. For consideration, um, Nate, I'm I'm confused. So, I just want to, you know, in my lawyerly way, applying law to facts, um, are we waiving the pop? The are you suggesting we should waive under the waiver section, or are we applying the alternative ratio, ensuring that adequate parking for the proposed use will be provided? Like that's 7.0. So, I don't think we can do both. We have to do one or the other. So, do you have a suggestion on which? part of the bylaw we should apply to this situation because it lists a bunch of factors we should look at or could look at maybe we should defer this for later but I, I don't think we can we may not have to waive the parking we might go under 7.0 or we can if we go under the parking waiver then we need to follow those do, I mean do you have a suggestion for that well, I mean, I think some of the intent of that of the revisions to the parking section is that, you know, two parking spaces may not be appropriate or relevant, right? And so then it's the applicants, um, you know, uh, it's on the applicant to provide what is the appropriate number and the board can ask for information. And so if, you know, my, the way the, this project is being permitted is it's for matriculated students. And so if if there are is a lease can you know uh, condition that the tenant is responsible for finding parking through their uh, you know institution of higher education, then that could satisfy the parking requirement because you know it's it they they're going to go through the university or through Amherst College or whatever institution they're enrolled in to find parking, and so um, you know if we if if the board needs more information in terms of how many would that be or how many parking spaces can it accommodate what we've heard is that umass has enough spaces to accommodate the parking demand that's being you know asked so you know i don't you know it's it's really i guess a matter of how comfortable is the board with the you know that and the bylaw so it's also bedroom count you know traffic impact parking utilization you know peak demand proximity to downtown proximity to public transit Availability of alternative modes of transportation, uh, tenant lease restrict restrictions, shared or leased parking. Uh, so those are, you know, just a list of some criteria, and there could be more. So, you know, if if we if the board thinks there needs to be more information, um, then there could be. I mean, I think some of it is with the traffic impact. I mean, you know, we've heard some 
the planning board or the staff has heard from some members saying they're worried about traffic spillover. And so, you know, one question would be, is a tenant who lives here really going to park, you know, two miles away on Lincoln Ave every day, uh, but live up on Olympia Drive? You know, is it really going to be an impact to downtown resident residential neighborhoods because of this development? And not, you know, my thought is, uh, I'm not sure someone would park that far away, um, given where their residence is. Also, so, the, but you know that's something I think the board should discuss. Is there is there uh, concern about a, some traffic um, with this, you know, or parking with this offsite parking, or a parking study with of uh, use within 800 feet? I mean, I right. hope the police section doesn't eat the whole section. I mean, you know, given the parking plan that was presented, there's hundreds of parking spaces within 800 feet. I mean, so I, I, you know, I don't, I don't have the right answer, but you know, if we haven't, I mean, as far as I understand, the town hasn't heard complaints about um, Olympia Place, and so I'm not sure, um, you know, we could, you know, we could investigate further, but we haven't, you know, we haven't heard anything that there is a parking problem with that development. Well, uh, you know, it looks to me, you know, based on. Uh, the way 7.0000 reads, and so or 7.0000, you know, that bulleted list, we have a number of conditions in that list that are applicable to this property. So, you know, I think it would be pretty straightforward to say we would be that the, the adequate number of off street parking spaces is zero. Uh, because of you know it, this this property and this project uh, have the characteristics that are in that list um, you know proximity to public transit tenant lease restrictions relative to parking shared or lease parking elsewhere so you know Janet I don't think we need to go to the waiver section we could do it right here. All right, are there any other other comments from Is it folks? Of meeting? No. Didn't write that. Yeah. Uh, 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 Karen, yeah. it sounds like you are back. Uh, you're muted. So just for reference, the time is 8.20, and I think Karen Winter just returned to the meeting. Welcome back, Karen. Thank you. All right. So uh board members we've gone through a lot of comment here this evening um and i think uh we are going to need to decide whether we're comfortable enough with this project to spend the time to go through the draft uh findings and conditions that that, that chris has prepared so i wondered if we could get a kind of a straw poll as to whether people are comfortable enough to go through that or not uh, Janet, I see your hand. Um, I have a quick question. Is there a lighting plan? I have like so many pieces of paper. I don't, I, is there a lighting plan? Uh, I don't remember. Um, we, we have not submitted the photometric plan beyond the bollards and the lighting that's shown on the landscape plan. And, and all the bollards and lighting are dark sky compliant? Correct. Okay. All right. So, um, I'd like to just get a straw poll here. Uh, so I'd like to go around the board and just ask, are you comfortable moving on to the findings and conditions? Uh, so let's, uh, I'll just start with you, Bruce. Yes, I'm comfortable doing that. All right, uh, Tom. Yeah, I'm fine. We're still waiting on information though, correct? From um, the wetlands or? Yeah, we haven't, we haven't got the final uh, decisions and conditions from the Conservation Commission. Okay, so uh, but, we won't be approving tonight, but we, we won't. We, we'll, doubt, okay. we don't intend to approve. We'll be continuing to December. Is it the 20, 21. 21st? 21. 21st, yeah. Great, that's fine. Okay, I, I, I agree. Let's move forward. Thank you. Okay, um, Andrew. Agree, let's go. Okay, uh, Janet. That's fine. Okay, uh, Johanna. Onwards. All right, and Karen? 
Yes, I I also approve. And I, I've been here for a while. Sorry. Okay, great. Yeah. In case you missed it, what we're 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 gonna go ahead and go through the findings and conditions. Uh, we've had a long conversation about parking and whether we need to impose conditions that are uh, sort of protective of the tenants. Um, but so far, we haven't really got a consensus about that. Um, Chris? I just wanted to note that um, Karin will be able to watch the video of this um, proceeding, and it would be um, necessary for her to do that in order for her to vote on December 21st. So and and will her. you need an email or a letter from her saying she has watched the proceedings and therefore she understands she is eligible to vote? Yes, I will need that. Yep. So you'll need documentation. Yep. Okay. okay. Okay, so uh, actually the time now is 823 and we usually take a break around eight. So I'm thinking, why don't we take a five minute break now and then we can come back and go through findings and conditions and the rest of our agenda. So uh, please come back at 828. And uh, in the meantime, mute yourself and turn off your video. Thank you. Es geht noch viel weiter. Ich habe den Bescheid gesagt, dass du gebraucht hast. Wie mhm. ihr gesagt habt. Genau. Die haben es unheimlich nett gemacht, die beiden. Ja, du warst zum Teil auch da. Ja, ja. Über, ja. Die ist so spritzig. Ja. Karen, I'd like you to know that you are not muted. Oh, sorry.
All right, the time is 8.29. And if you are hiding behind your video that's off, if, please turn it back on. And uh, Pam, I hope you'll be ready to bring up the draft mm -hmm. findings and conditions. Mm -hmm. Again. Chris, uh, I see your hand. Are you going to want to say something at the beginning when we've got everybody back? Yeah, I just wondered if we wanted to start off with the findings. And what I would suggest is that, um, you know, we'll make edits to these findings tonight and then I can bring them back on the 21st of December for um, a final vote. Okay. So we, we probably won't have the final findings tonight, but you'll have the conversation about them. Right. Um, Doug, I'm here, but I'm off camera. Okay, thank you, Janet. So we've got everybody from the board back. Uh, Kyle, are you around? You are, okay. And, and I can dimly see Karen, uh, so I know she's there. All right, so that's fine. Hello. Um, all right, so Pam. Yes. If you could bring up the findings. I'm not sure I can. Where is Mr. Malloy? Oh, okay. I practiced it. I just sent him a text saying I'm failing at the sharing. Um, Nate, are you there? All right, Pam, we can see your screen. Yeah. Can't see the right screen. Um, let me see if I do it this way. Zoom document center. Yeah, there but, they are. Great. Can you see it? Yay. Yes. Hooray. Now if you can you can enlarge it a little bit, zoom in a couple of times. There we like go. That. Good, good, good. Okay. All right. So, Chris, um, I know we often read these aloud. So these are the findings having to do with the special permit. Um, and the special permit is for um, maximum height and um, building coverage. So um, I will start to read these. Uh, there was a request for a special permit to modify dimensional requirements <clears throat> for maximum building coverage and height requirements under Article 6, Table 3, Footnote A of the Zoning Bylaw. And here are the draft findings. The board found under Article 6, Table 3, Footnote A as follows. Height, that the new building is proposed to be 56 feet, 8 inches in height. That Article 6, Table 3, Dimensional Regulations limits the height of buildings in the Fraternity Residence RF District to 55 feet. Number three, that footnote A authorizes the Special Permit Granting Authority 
to grant a special permit to modify the height requirement if it applies the criteria established in section 10.395 of the zoning bylaw and considers the proposed modified dimensional requirement in the context of the patterns of the same dimensions established by existing buildings and landscape features in the surrounding neighborhood with which have a functional or vis, visual relationship to the proposed building. Number four, that the nearby building at 57 Olympia Drive is 67 feet in height in excess of the height limitations. That the nearby building at 57 Olympia Drive received a special permit in 2013, which was special permit number 2014-2 to modify the height limitation, and that decision for 57 Olympia Drive referred to tall buildings on the UMass campus in support of the requested height modification. Number six, that in accordance with section 10.395 of the zoning bylaw, the proposed height of 56 feet 8 inches does not create disharmony with respect to the terrain and to the use, scale, and architecture of existing buildings in the vicinity, which have a functional or visual relationship mm -hmm. there too. Pam, can you scroll up? Does anyone object to any of those findings? The ones that we just read? I do not see any hands. Okay, then I will proceed. Um, building coverage. Number one, that the new building is proposed to cover 45.35% of the property. Number two, that Article 6, Table 3, Dimensional Regulations, limits the maximum building coverage in the fraternity residence RF district to 45%. Number three, that footnote A authorizes the special permit granting authority <clears throat> to grant a special permit to modify the building coverage requirement if it applies the criteria established in section 10.395 of the zoning bylaw and considers the proposed mod modified dimensional requirement in the context of the patterns of the same dimensions established by existing buildings and landscape features in the surrounding neighborhood, which have a functional or visual relationship to the proposed building. That the nearby building at 57 Olympia Drive has a building coverage of 45% that in accordance with section 10.395 of the zoning bylaw, the proposed building coverage of 45.35% does not create disharmony with respect to the terrain and to the use, scale, and architecture of existing buildings in the vicinity, which have functional or visual relationship thereto. All right, so those are the findings for the special permit. Uh, anybody have any comments or objections on those? Okay. Okay, so we've, I don't see any objections. Uh, why don't we go to the findings for the site plan review? Well, oh uh, no, what have I done? I'm sure you can do it, Pam. I don't know. <laughs> Doing nerve wracking. I'm going in here. All right, draft possible findings. There it is. Perfect. Yeah. Yeah, you did it. Okay. Okay, this is a long one. Um, and these you are. Want, you want some help? Um, why don't we see if I can, how long I can last, and then someone can step in and help me if I'm faltering. Okay. Um, so the board found under section 11.24 of the zoning bylaw site plan review as follows. 11.2400. The project is in conformance with all appropriate provisions of the zoning bylaw, with the exception of the provisions requiring waiver of on site parking requirements and the special permit for modification of building coverage and height. The special permit has been applied for concurrently with the site plan review. A sign plan will be required as a condition of the site plan review and the applicant has provided a plan to show the location of handicapped parking in front of the building along Mather Drive. Um, I think we should also make a <clears throat> um, note that the applicant has um, requested a waiver of on-site parking. I don't think that's explicit in this finding the way I wrote it.
Okay. Um, the second one, 11.2401. Town amenities and abutting properties will be protected because detrimental or offensive actions are not planned for this site. The site appears to minimize the possibility of detrimental or offensive actions. 11.2402. Abutting properties will be protected from detrimental site characteristics resulting from the proposed use. Lighting will be downcast and will not shine onto adjacent properties. 11.2403, adequate recreational facilities, open space, and amenities will be provided because the property is close to UMass. Tenants will be able to use UMass recreational facilities <clears throat> since most tenants will be associated with the university. The property is located near a town-owned property with access to a trail that connects through Olympia Oaks to, town, to a town-owned trail system providing additional recreational opportunities. And the building proposed for the site is large and takes up much of the property, but there is a courtyard proposed near the entry, which is available for use by the tenants. Uh, Are you uh, noting if anybody has come? Yeah, Chris, uh, Jan Janet just raised her hand. So. Um, I don't think the bylaw lets you count um, sort of fields in, you know, the UMass fields, but I know that the um, building itself has a lot of workout space and, you know, group space, and there's a courtyard, and then there would be some access to local trails. So I don't think we have to count the UMass stuff in, and I don't think that's what the bylaw is requiring. It's like the applicant has to provide the recreation, not UMass. So I, I don't. So you would you would remove the the first. Yeah, because of that paragraph. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Because tenants will be able to use UMass facilities. We'll strike that, and we'll strike. Um, because the property is close to UMass. Yeah, there's plenty of good stuff in the building. And we'll list the uh, recreational space in the building. And keep the courtyard reference. And keep the courtyard reference. And the connection, can we, uh, Janet, any objection to mentioning the town owned land adjacent and the trail system? Yeah, I think, I think they, you know, if people can get access to it through the yard, that sounds fine, so. Okay. Um, 11.2410 is not applicable because there are no unique or important natural, historic, or scenic features on the site. 11.2411, proposed methods of refuse disposal are described in the management plan. They are considered to be adequate. Trash will be stored inside the building in a refrigerated storage area. 11.2412, the ability of the proposed sewage disposal and water supply systems to serve the proposed use is considered to be adequate. The property is connected to the town sewer and water systems, and the town engineer has reviewed the project and has not expressed concern with the proposal regarding these issues. So the town, the property is actually connected to the town, will be connected to the town sewer and water systems through the connection that is on in Mather Drive. So maybe we should note that. And Mather Drive is owned by UMass. OK. Um, 11.2413. The ability of the proposed drainage system within and adjacent to the site to handle any increased runoff resulting from the development is considered to be adequate. The town engineer has reviewed the project and has not expressed concerns with the proposed system. The project has also been reviewed by the Wetlands Administrator and Conservation Commission. Um, so they're in the process of being reviewed by the Conservation Commission. So that statement will only be completed um, after we hear from the Conservation Commission. Anybody have a problem with that? I don't see any hands. Okay. I just put mine up. Uh, I, I, I don't have a problem. I just, a uh, question is uh, whether it says has been reviewed by the Wetlands Administrator and Conservation Commission. Shouldn't there be some favorable finding associated with that? 
I mean, just say, and, and mean, who've, who found favor with the project or something like that. Accepted or reviewed yes. positively or exactly approved or. So that will have to be filled in after the Conservation Commission um, makes its determination. Right. Yeah. Okay. 11.2414, provision of adequate landscaping will be satisfactory because a landscape plan has been submitted. The landscape plan has been prepared in accordance with the Amherst landscaping guidelines. And you all have received a copy of that, of the plan. Um, 11.2415, the erosion control plan has been submitted. It has been reviewed by the town engineer and the conservation commission. In this case, I did make a statement and has been found to be satisfactory, but that has not yet come to pass. Right. The town engineer finds it satisfactory, but um, we need to make sure that the CONCOM finds it satisfactory. And so far, we Chris, haven't heard anything negative about their erosion control plan from the conservation commission. Chris, hold on a second. Bruce has got his hand up again. Um, it, just in relation to the landscape plan, um, I believe uh, the the uh, development report noted that the landscape plan, whereas, and I've seen it, we've all seen it, it's got uh, it's very detailed and so forth, but the uh, the column that gives the numbers of the specific plants has not been completed. They're all just uh, zeros or dashes. And the development plan notes that the quantities of the various plants uh, should be uh, uh, well, I, actually, I guess this is correct, isn't it? Because the, we're, we're finding that it's been prepared in accordance. But, uh, well, is accordance, uh, does, does that require the, uh, the statement, uh, the numeric statement of the numbers of the various uh, pieces? Or are we going to, uh, are we not, or are we not, do we not need that uh, uh, piece of information? So it's you're saying that the drawings really aren't final because they haven't, included that num the quantities of species I, I i guess it's a question first of all does that indicate that they're not yet final and b is is my uh, information up to date or have i just not seen the most recent uh, version of the uh, landscape plan okay chris you have your hand yes um the landscape plan is the most recent one that you have um and it does not include the quantities so okay. we can ask um, that uh, Kyle provide that information before the next meeting. Kyle, do you see that being a problem? Uh, I don't. I think the quantities are just represented graphically rather than uh, numerically in the chart. Um, we could we could look to do that. Okay, great. Bruce, you're all set. All right, then I'll drop your hand. Okay. Oh, and I'll drop my hand too. All right. Um, okay, 11.2416, adjacent properties will be protected from the intrusion of various nuisances, including pollution, light, and noise. Okay. 11 point, any problem with well, that? Well, I guess, Chris, what do you really mean by that? And, and you know, how, how, are, how are you, I mean, do, do we need to have that statement? Because it seems pretty ambiguous how it's protected. What does the original state 2.2416? Okay, here's the original. Protection of adjacent properties by minimizing the intrusion of air and water pollution, flood, noise, odor, dust, and vibration through appropriate site and structure design and the use of appropriate design and materials for containment, ventilation, filtering, screening, soundproofing, sound dampening, and other similar solutions. I could um, make I think we need, uh, yeah, we need to list some of those uh, nuisances, you know, we, or, or, or the intrusion of all those things is minimized. So would you like me to be more detailed about um, how the intrusion of these things is minimized? I think we do need to just because it's kind of ambiguous. Okay, so I'll do that for next time. Okay. Um, 11.2417, protection of adjacent properties by minimizing 
the intrusion of lighting has been discussed. We haven't really discussed that because we haven't seen a, a lighting plan yet. Um, um, Kyle, are we likely to have a lighting plan? Yes, and the bollards, uh, I don't have a photometric plan that I've shown. The, the lighting and the bollards are shown in the landscape plan and the civil and architectural, but we will be forwarding a photometric plan. Okay. So we'll wait until we see the photometric plan to um, finish this finding. Is that correct? But we do know that exterior lighting will be required to be downcast and dark sky mm -hmm. compliant. Um, and the applicant. Uh, I mean, Kyle, will you be including the catalog cuts in, in that package? Yes. So, Chris, you can you go back to the has submitted. Has submitted. OK. At, as of the time when you will. Uh, yeah, as meetings. of yeah. how we expect it to be next meeting. Yeah. Or in the, on the 21st. OK. 11.2418 is not applicable because the property is not located in a flood zone in a flood zone conservancy district. 11.2419 wetlands will be protected by building in accordance with the provisions of the wetlands protection act chapter 131 section 40 and the Amherst wetlands bylaw. The project has been reviewed by the conservation commission um, and I'm hoping that next time we meet I can say that the conservation commission has uh, issued an order of conditions or has um, closed its public hearing or something to that effect. Okay, 11.2420 is not applicable and that is having to do with um, things that are in certain districts that are not RF. So if you're in the BL, BBC, BN, COM, OP, LI, or PRP district, um, these things apply, but we're not in any of those districts. So we're not applicable. Uh, Chris, Bruce has his hand up. Yeah. Uh, I can't see. Uh, it seems like it needs to be scrolled. We're up, sorry. Good, thank My you. My apologies. Okay, 11.2420 is not applicable. 11.2421, the development is reasonably consistent with respect to setbacks, landscaping, entrances, and exits with surrounding buildings and development. There will be no on site parking. Tenants who own cars may purchase parking permits from UMass and use the adjacent UMass parking lots. Although there is no on site parking, there will be a significant number of bike racks on the site located along the northern property line. Two handicapped parking spaces will be provided in the parking lot along Mather Drive with a crosswalk leading to the new building entry court. Is there anything else we want to say about that? Uh, Andrew has his hand up. Yeah, I was just wondering, I, I know I'd ask Kyle if we might be able to up the number of handicapped spots. I think he said he could look into that. So just be where we land um, in later December. Uh, Bruce. Um, I was going to ask a question, um, uh, but it was a small one related to bike. Uh, I, I, I don't think uh, the development report notes that there's no uh, bike storage, interior bike storage. I mean, I, I know that Carl's mentioned that people routinely take their bicycles, particularly the ones they can carry upstairs and so forth. But uh, I'm wondering, um, uh, I was going to ask Carl whether any thought had been given to uh, carving out some space for, uh, I don't know, a small number of electric bicycles, which I don't think would be, uh, people would trust the outdoor spaces for them and they would need to be able to be plugged in somewhere. And I'm wondering whether the, uh, as time goes by, uh, this kind of uh, uh, requirement might uh, grow and whether we wouldn't ask, uh, whether you wouldn't, Kyle, uh, give some thought to whether that uh, likely um, uh, evolution of uh, need would be catered for or could be catered for in some way within the building. And um, uh, and if, if that were the case, then uh, that would also be a finding. Kyle, any thoughts about interior storage? Uh, yeah, I think 
the interior storage is in the unit. Uh, I think that that's what we found uh, folks who are looking to bring their bike in. We've got other interior storage, bike storage at other buildings, uh, not highly used. Uh, so I think we've tried to strike a balance between exterior and covering it and interior in the unit. I, I was thinking of the heavier electric bikes, Kyle, which may become uh, a feature of the future. But uh, I, I dare say when that arises, uh, you could decide to deal with it. I can see a number of ways. So I'll just uh, take that as a not yet answer. All right. Thanks, Bruce. Chris, you may okay. read. Okay. Um, 11.2422, the building site avoids to the extent feasible impact on steep slopes, floodplains, scenic views, grade changes, and wetlands. 11.2423, not applicable. There will be only one building on the site. 11.2424, screening has been proposed for the mechanical systems on the roof. They will be located on the roof and surrounded by a parapet wall. Trash will be stored in the building so there will be no dumpster on site. 11.2430, the site has been designed to provide for the convenience and safety of vehicular and pedestrian movement, both within the site and in relation to adjoining ways and properties. There will be pedestrian access at three points into the building from the courtyard area. Um, do, you, do you really need to say anything about vehicular? Because no. there's really no vehicular movement on the site. No. Nope. Okay. Um, the lo okay, 11.2431, the location and number of curb cuts is designed to minimize turning movements and hazardous exits and entrances. There will be only one curb cut for the service area at the side of the building, and there is an existing curb cut in the vicinity of this location. There will also be provision in the parking area along Mather Drive for two handicapped parking spaces and a crosswalk to the new building. 11.2432, um, the location and design of parking spaces, bicycle racks, and drive aisles will be provided in a safe manner. <clears throat> so that really, I should take uh, parking spaces out of there. Well, parking spaces are provided along Mather Drive. So there are handicapped parking spaces along Mather Drive. And they're not on the site, but they are adjacent. So can I leave the parking spaces in there? Yeah, I guess I wonder whether we need drive aisles. Is, is so, that a term that you use in a parking lot? Yes. So, well, I mean, I, I, I mean, there is a drive aisle on the Mather Drive. On Mather. Um, okay. So anyway, the uh, location and design of parking spaces, bicycle racks, and drive aisles will be provided in a safe manner. Bike racks will be provided on the north side of the building along the northern property line. A waiver has been requested from on-site parking requirements. Um, number 10.2433 is... It's 11. 11.2433 11 is provision for access to adjoining properties. So that's not applicable. 11.2434, where possible driveways located in the commercial and industrial and business district shall be located opposite each other. That's not applicable. 11.2435, joint access driveways between a, adjoining properties, and that's not applicable. And then 11.2436, a traffic impact and access study provided prepared by Venice Hangen was submitted with the site plan review application for the previous project at 57 Olympia Drive. A new traffic impact and access study has been submitted mm -hmm. now. I wrote this back in... Mm -hmm. I don't know, a month ago, um, has been submitted for the new building to be known as 47 Mather Drive in the future. The new proposed project is not expected to result in notable impacts to area traffic operations. And 11.2437, a traffic impact report um, has been submitted, has been submitted by the applicant. It is, it, yeah, so we don't need that second part that it's expected to be submitted. Okay, so that's that's it for the um, findings for the site plan review.
All right, I don't see any hands. And I'll make those changes that we talked about. And now do we want to go to talk about conditions? Sure. Mm -hmm. Bear with me. It's only, it's only nine o'clock, we can keep going. Ordinarily, we still have one more um, person to talk to, Mr. Gerfine, so. Yeah. And forget about him. Yeah. Um, so the conditions are related to um, the site plan review. I haven't drafted any conditions related to the special permit for the uh, dimensional requirements, and I don't think those are needed, but um, you can let me know if you think they are needed. Um, <clears throat> so the waivers that have been requested are the waiver for a sign plan, a traffic impact report, and on-site parking. So we no longer need the waiver for the traffic impact report because one has been submitted. Um, so I'll start reading the conditions and uh, see where we go. Um, condition number one in the general uh, category, the development must shall be built substantially in, in accordance with plans submitted to the planning board and approved on, hopefully it'll be December 21st, um, and we'll fill that in. Number two, the development shall be managed substantially in accordance with the management plan submitted to the planning board and approved on X date. Um, number three, occupancy of dwelling units at 47 Olympia Drive shall be limited to matriculated students enrolled at the University of Massachusetts Amherst, Amherst College or Hampshire College and their family members and the resident manager and his or her family members to the extent allowed by law. Um, number four. Uh, yeah. um, and maybe this is a question for Kyle. Um, if I were, if I were a student at Greenfield Community College, would I be able to be in your project? Uh, it's a good question. I mean, we've currently got this provision at 57. Um, uh, obviously the majority of folks are from, you know, yeah. Well, uh, I just, I guess I wondered whether, like to accommodate, but whether it should just say matriculated at, a, at an institution of higher education or yep. something like that. And just because that's what the zoning limits it to. Yeah. And not name the institutions. Okay, so we will take care of that. Um, number four, parking for tenants at 47 Olympia Drive shall be provided as set forth in the management plan for 47 Olympia Drive. If the availability of parking for tenants changes from what is set forth in the management plan, the owner shall submit a new parking proposal to the planning board for its review and approval. What do you think about that one? Is that okay? Yeah. And number five, a lease shall be submitted to the planning board for re review and approval. I think we did get the lease already. Mm -hmm. um, the lease shall include the following. A, limitation on who may occupy the dwelling units at, Univer at 47 Olympia Drive as described in condition three above. B, information regarding parking, including a statement in the lease that students have responsibility for obtaining parking permits for their own vehicles. And we've decided to eliminate um, everything after that in B, which I have crossed out on my copy here. I think that's correct. Nate's raised his hand. Oh, yeah. Sorry, just going back to number um, three, the bylaw and the use chart does... Um, say uh you know a fraternity or sorority building or social dormitory or similar similar use related to amherst college hampshire college or the university of massachusetts oh okay All so right. i mean it doesn't it says related to but i don't i don't know if we can okay so they like those that. can stay then yeah i guess if it's that specific it is yeah okay thanks nate yeah um number six upon change of ownership or if the property is no longer managed by archipelago Archipelago Investments LLC or its affiliate Amherst Innovative Living LLC, 
The new owner and or manager shall submit a new management plan to the planning board at a public meeting for its review and approval. The purpose of the meeting shall be for the board to determine whether conditions of the permit are being complied with and whether any modification to the site plan review approval or management plan is required. Okay. Um, number seven, substantial changes to the project and or substantial changes to any approved site plans or to the exterior of the building shall be submitted to the planning board for its review and approval prior to the work taking place. The purpose of the submittal shall be for the planning board to approve the change <clears throat> and or to determine whether the changes are de minimis or significant enough to require modification of the special permit or site plan approval. Number eight, landscaping shall be installed in accordance with the landscape plan prior to the issuance of the certificate of occupancy and once installed shall be continually maintained as needed. All disturbed areas shall be loamed and seeded unless otherwise specified. Number nine, the building shall meet all required energy efficiency codes and regulations of the stretch energy code. In addition, low flow plumbing fixtures shall be installed throughout the project. Uh, Bruce has his hand up. Just gives me the opportunity to ask another small question that I had related to the development report, which I think says that the hot water is uh, by gas and it goes on to talk about gas connections and so forth. But Chris, uh, I think maybe that is uh, an anachronistic comment or uh, in Kyle, is there indeed gas uh, energy providing the water heating? Uh, the intent is that it a all electric hot water, uh, the same system that we're using at 11 EP downtown. We are going to need some fossil fuel for the generator, uh, but the hope is that that's the only fossil fuel that we use. So that would uh, be what would drive uh, a propane tank, and which we may get to at some point. Uh, just for the generator. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. All right, Chris. Um. I think we were up to number 10. And this, this site plan review approval shall expire within two years of the date that it is filed with the town clerk, unless it has been both recorded at the Registry of Deeds and substantial construction or use has commenced within the two year time period. Um, number 11, construction shall be completed within, and I wrote 30 months here. I think that was what we said for 11, um, East Pleasant Street, and I don't know, um, that's a something that you could discuss with the applicant. Um, anyway, 30 months from the date of issuance of the building permit. If more time is needed, the applicant shall come to the planning board at a public meeting for review and approval of an extension of time. So is 30 months? Um, 30 months is fine. Kyle is indicating that's fine. Okay. Um, Okay, I crossed out the next things because they've been submitted. Um, number 14, a sign plan shall be submitted to the planning board for its review and approval prior to the installation of signs. Now, um, the applicant has asked for a waiver of the sign plan, but usually we put something in about signs in the conditions. So I think he doesn't actually need a sign plan waiver at this time. Has everyone agreed with that? that agreed that we should have him come back. Have him come back and he doesn't need a waiver of the sign plan, yes. he'll come back. Uh, anybody object, please raise your hand. Okay. No, no, not seeing any objection. <clears throat> okay, number 15, detailed plans of paved areas and detailed information about site improvements, including information related to, the handi to handicapped accessibility, such as surface treatments, Grading, spot elevations, railings, et cetera, shall be submitted to the planning board for review and approval. Um, I This was written for another project that had fewer details about paved areas, but I think, um, so I think maybe we'll come back to this one on the 21st and we should look at the uh, plans to see if they're detailed enough for your um, approval. Okay. And, and I would just quickly, I would hope that they are so that we could get rid of this uh, condition so that it's not uh, uh, difficult to interpret down the road. 
So we'll we'll look at that. Okay. Um, number 16, one hard copy and one digital copy of the final revised plans should, shall be submitted to the planning department. Number 17, uh, this has to do with uh, the use, uh, residential use. The total number of dwelling units to be constructed at the project shall be limited to a maximum of 68 units, nine studios, two one-bedroom units, one two-bedroom unit, seven three-bedroom units, and 49 four-bedroom units. There shall be one unit set aside for a resident manager. So this is a question that I have for Kyle. Um, in the 68 units, does that include the unit for the resident manager? Yes, we took one of the 68 offline and made it a resident manager unit. Okay. All right. Um, number 18. The building shall not exceed a maximum of five stories and a total of 56 feet, eight inches. Oh. Chris, yeah. um, I can't quite do the math quickly enough, but for number 17, those those count of units. Doesn't add up to 68. Well, well, it should add up to 68, but would which which type of unit did you take offline, Kyle, for the resident manager? Um, let me see. I think it's a one bed on the first floor. I, don't know. I okay. could just make a note that All right. there That's will fine. be one unit set aside for a resident yeah. manager, one bedroom on the first floor. How's that? Okay. Okay. Number 18, the building shall not, oh, I, I started that. Yeah, the building shall not exceed a maximum of five stories and a total of 56 feet, eight inches. And the, the word feet can come out of there. Measured from average finished grade on the street side of the building to the highest point of the flat roof, excluding any parapet or other rooftop equipment as outlined in section 6.17 of the zoning bylaw. Number nineteen. Uh, uh, question. Uh, Bruce has his hand up. Chris, um, I I did the math and it adds up. And I thought, well, that's fine. I'll, uh, but then I thought uh, the uh, the additional blue piece there that says there shall be one unit set aside, and Kyle says, well, that's included in the sixty eight. So if you do the math, but you add another one uh, because you read the blue pieces there, then it would add up to sixty nine. Um, so I should I would say it should say including one unit that is set aside for a resident manager something like that so you know that the uh, what, what's one of the one of the sixty eight is yes for the resident make manager. it make it clear so that people leading this in the future don't wonder whether it's a bad math or yep what have you okay thank you sounds good. Number 19, um, the principal use shall remain a private apartment style dormitory and shall not be changed to any other residential use. I think this was put in there because um, the original planning board that reviewed 57 Olympia Drive was concerned that it could possibly become just a regular apartment building and, and that wouldn't be allowed in the RF zoning district. Mm -hmm. Number 20, the property shall not be used for temporary no less than 12 month short term housing, short term lodging or advertised as such in print. And that that's a question for Kyle. Is there any reason to think that this might be rented in a different way? And is this a question? Oh, that's fine. That's fine. That's, that's fine. Okay. Um, number 21, apartments shall meet all applicable AAB and ADA requirements with 5% of the total units being fully accessible and all units visitable, including at least one accessible unit on the first floor. Is that okay? I would say I think that's that's fine. At, at some point, the AAB and the ADA requirements may shift. So some of those on paper, those may no longer be applicable if those ever go up. So or do you want to say all? currently applicable uh you could just shorten it to say apartment shall meet all applicable a b and ada requirements uh per the building code at the time of construction uh -huh. it's not a big concern but just in other words take the five percent out yeah if that changes and becomes more or less down the down yeah. the road 
just so in other words it would read applic uh, apartments shall meet all applicable aab and ada requirements at the time of construction okay and then scratch the rest of it okay um well do we want one accessible unit on the first floor uh i assume that's not a requirement of the aab or ada no that would be a requirement of yours I and think there was a board that are the maybe a number 57 there was interest in having that you made that a requirement of um 11 east pleasant street so do you want that to be a requirement here or not kyle is that a hardship uh i i have no problem doing that that's fine so we'll leave okay. that in bruce you have your hand up uh yes i did with an elevator i don't see why it would uh, be important to why we should care basically why do we care well i think during 11 east pleasant there was some concern that uh some handicapped uh folks would just as soon not have to deal with an elevator all the time so we wanted to have some options for them on a first floor unit okay so i guess we'll leave it chris okay number 22 the units at the project shall be registered and permitted in accordance with the amherst res residential rental property bylaw Loss or suspension of, a, suspension of a rental permit shall constitute a violation of this condition. Um, and then marketing and lease requirements. Number 23, residential leases shall be a minimum duration of 12 months. Is that something that we want to keep in? And is that does that fit in with Kyle's plan? Kyle, uh, you say you're good with that, but I know uh, in the recent history when uh, UMass changed its academic calendar, uh, the, the local landlords had to adjust the end date of some of their leases. So you might end up with an 11 month lease to get back in sync with UMass. Uh, do you wanna have that flexibility? uh i i appreciate that we ended up with some 13 month leases to accommodate a later move out date <laughs> um, i i don't know if we need to get into that okay uh, um, all right that. just wanted to bring it up number 24 any substantial modifications of the lease agreement which may impact tenant oversight as determined by the building commissioner specifically excluding minor updates such as pricing date modifications clerical errors or language updates required by the Commonwealth of Massachusetts or other government entities shall require the applicant to return to the planning board at a public meeting. Okay. Um, building exterior and site improvements, 25. The applicant shall, sh shall submit a plan showing bicycle parking and storage to the planning board for review and approval. Well, he's already done that. So I think we can take that out. Mm -hmm. And it looks like the next one could come out too. Uh, the town engineer and building commissioner shall inspect the construction of the entry driveway. So that just means that, oh, there's no entry driveway yet. Right. Well, yeah. Okay. And there's no on site, say, paved areas, or yeah, I guess there I mean, is. Well, sidewalks, but there's some sidewalks. Think, yeah. I don't think the town engineer needs to inspect the sidewalks all uh number 27 which is going to change the number of these are going to change but um all line site utilities shall be underground uh bruce um i'm just thinking i can't remember the site plan but i'm i'm thinking there should be some driveways related to uh access to dumpsters and so forth wouldn't there be i i'm sorry i can't remember the plan in my head well enough there is a service driveway on the south side of the building that's so what i thought do you want to leave um what is shown as 26 in here well i, I think i think that uh, it makes sense if because it's a driveway it's a short one but uh okay okay number 28 all exterior lighting shall be dark sky compliant 
Exterior lighting shall be downcast, shielded, and shall not shine onto adjacent properties or streets. All right. And then completion of work. I think these are boilerplate things having to do with construction. And in the past, we haven't um, yeah, we chosen don't... to read all of those. Right. So hopefully we can skip those for tonight. Um, you could you could review amenities and management plan. Uh, you want to scroll down? Yes. Yeah. Pam? Yes. Janet, I see your hand. So um, I think I might, I'm really speaking at a turn here, but I thought that um, we should have a requirement of um, on-site management or staff 24 seven. Um, so, um, and I think, and that is being satisfied by having a, a live-in manager plus the reception. And that that's been a requirement of the other buildings. And so I, I thought that um, the management plan didn't, uh, the management plan, the old management plan doesn't reflect that. And then just the language is really unclear. So I thought we should just say, there has to be someone from staff on site all the time. You know, it could be, you know, obviously it could be the receptionist. It could be the, um, the on, you know, the live-in manager. It could be anybody, but just to make sure that somebody's there 24 seven. Any and objections to that, Kyle? You could add that to 40, I'm sorry, 41 there as part of that. All right. Perfect. And I think the management plan might need some revision because I just found it kind of murky. So Kyle, do you think you can review that? Uh, I, I, I guess I'd ask the question, what was murky uh, on the plan? Okay, Janet? You know, maybe I should just send this to you later because, um, or send it to Chris. It was just like, I think it, it we meant to say that without just simply saying it. And so I could, maybe I'll just do a quick look at it right now and I can email that to Chris or something later. Mm -hmm. Okay, sounds good. Um, anyway, we were going to review the amenities section and the management plan section. Um, number 37, the entire project and building shall be smoke-free, non-smoking to the extent allowed by law. Um, and then the management plan, 38, all move-ins or move-outs shall occur during the hours of 8 a.m. to 7 p.m. and shall be coordinated through the leasing office as to lessen the impacts of multiple moving trucks blocking parking or the fire lane. 39, snow plowed within the project shall be promptly removed from the site as part of the clearing process to the extent possible. Number 40, all trash pickup deliveries and operation of construction, maintenance, machinery, and landscaping equipment shall be conducted during the hours of 8 a.m. to 7 p.m. Exemptions shall include emergency vehicles, snow removal, or other emergency situations as approved by the building commissioner. Number 41, the project shall comply with and be managed in, in accordance with all the terms of the management plan. Any alterations to this plan shall be approved by the planning board at a public meeting. If the property or business operations are sold, the new owner shall meet with the planning board at a public meeting to review the management plan and to determine if it is still applicable and to decide whether or not to hold a public hearing to review and approve the new management plan. And then we'll make reference to the on-site management 24-7. Um, and then the last one, 42, a demolition permit shall be issued prior, prior to any de demolition on the property taking place. Uh, we have two hands, Chris. Bruce, um, I, I, I appreciate uh, Carl suggesting we put the uh, on-site resident manager into uh, forty-one. But I think if it's in the management plan, it's 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 redundant in here, and, uh, and and clearly the management plan is intended that we don't have to put all the details of it into this. We simply refer to the management plan. So I would suggest that the resident manager requirement uh, be handled as Jen is proposing that any clarity or the specific in the management plan, then we, we leave it at that. All right, Andrew. Thanks, Doug. Um, <clears throat> I was just wondering on item 37, um, 
I just don't know what is sort of the, the latest relative to vaping and then this is sort of calling out non smoking, but should there be is there any interest in this? Like is, is should this should there be some reference to vaping in here as well? Uh, I I can't tell you that I have any knowledge about where that stands. Neither do I. Let me see. Kyle dropped. With I guess is this something would this be something that the you know that the the landlord would typically um impose or this is something the town I mean I know we've got it down here for the conditions, but is this do we request this of I mean, is this common item in here? And uh yeah. yeah I Should see Kyle has left the meeting. I mean, we'll we'll come back at this next month anyway. But I'd I'd be yeah, curious to know. Yeah, I mean, twenty one. It's it's you know they're they're. I don't know whether that's just for a healthy environment. Whether this the majority of these folks can be under twenty one. Um, kind of the the nature of that that being in here. But um, Chris, do you think you could ask Kyle about his policy with respect to vaping, and we could at least have that answer for the next meeting. Yes, and is um, Andrew considering including vaping in this sentence? I it sounds I, like. I, I mean, I I'm honestly I don't I don't know at this point. I mean, I would certainly I would love to see it out, right? Um, just dealing with kids at the the middle school and high school that are are facing uh, this, and it's it's not. I mean, it's if the the idea of not allowing smoking is to prevent obnoxious fumes, well, you know, vaping will shed obnoxious vapors as well. So it's it can be just as offensive. I don't know if the health, you know, I, I don't know enough about the health mm -hmm. side of it, but. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. So we'll look into that. Right. Uh, Janet? I've, I found um, the um, 517 management plan doesn't have um, explicitly say it's on-site management. And so I, I can rewrite that a little bit. Um, do you want to do you want to hear it now or? I thought that the new management plan said specifically that there was on-site management. Thank so it's it, yeah, it says on. So the question it says on-site management is the is the you know heading and says yes. Period. Resident on-site manager apartment on ground floor management will be staffed at front desk. Property management on call, 24 hours a day, lobby entrance, key code secure. And so I thought, you know, I thought just, I think the other building just, is it more clear saying, you know, yes, on-site staffing 24 seven with a resident on-site manager, apartment manager, apartment on ground floor and management will be staffed at the front desk. So it's a little, it's a little wordier, but it just doesn't clearly say there's always going to be someone there. So does Janet have language that she'd like to send me to include? Yeah, why not? Why don't they do that? Because it's, it's, yeah. Let me find. Yep. And then also, I think Rob Morris sometimes likes things in the conditions because he finds it easier to enforce. So I don't know. That kind of cuts against Andrew's argument a little bit. Maybe you could ask Rob that if he'd like to see that in the conditions. I think it was Bruce that suggested we didn't need it if it was in the management plan. Okay, Bruce, no, sorry. Yeah. Um, you know, it seemed like uh, Kyle was fine with including it at the end of section 41. So, yeah. So why, don't, okay. why don't we just do that? You all set, Janet? Yeah. All right. Um, Chris, your hand is up. I was just going to say we should include it as a condition. So thanks. Um, we've already decided to do that. Okay. All right. So that's through the amenities and management plan. Uh, do we need to do any read any more of these this evening? I don't think so. All right. Great. Um, we have two attendees in the public. So I, I wondered whether either of them wanted to make any public comments on this project before we continue the public hearing. And Chris, we will need a date or a time for that on the 21st. 
I don't see either uh, public attendee raising their hand, so I'll assume there's no comments from them. Um, could we have a motion to continue this hearing unless anybody wants to say anything else this evening um, to uh, December 21st at what time, Chris? Seven o'clock. I would like to know if everybody's going to be here on the 21st. So that's one thing that we should find out. And Wednesday, the 21st. Uh, Andrew, your hand is up, uh, maybe about the motion, but yeah, I was about the motion. I, I, I'll move. I was going to move on the motion. I don't know at this point whether I'll be available on the 21st. I assume that does I will. anybody else have a is anybody else questionable? I guess we should say, Tom, your hand is up. You were going to second, right? Oh, I was going to second, but I'm, I have no, no okay. issues. So, so Chris, it seems like the, the initial response is everybody except Andrew, it seems to think they'll be here and Andrew doesn't really know. Okay. So, we should, so we should have a quorum. Chris, can I ask why you're choosing seven o'clock? Um, I'm sorry, I, Pam. I knew you would bring me back to reality. Okay. <laughs> 635 is good because we don't have any other um, right. public hearings scheduled for that night. Okay. Perfect. Okay. So, um, Andrew, do you want to make a motion that we continue this hearing to December? 21st at 6.35. I'd be delighted to do so. All right, and Tom, how about a second? I will second that. All right, great. Uh, anybody want to discuss this further this evening? All right, uh, we'll go ahead and vote. Bruce? Aye. Tom? Aye. Andrew? Aye. Janet? Hi. Johanna. Hi. Karen. Hi. And I'm an I as well. That's unanimous. All right. Thank you all. Uh, I guess Kyle has departed. We can't thank him. Time is 931 and we'll move to the next item on the agenda. Assuming I can find it. All right, this is old business item five, uh, site plan review 2020-03 with Jonathan Gerfine, Riverside Organics, 555 Belchertown Road. Review of certain changes to the site plan under condition number seven of SBR 2020-03, including placement of concrete blocks in driveway and parking lot for a marijuana product manufacturer and marijuana micro business under section 3.363.5 of the zoning bylaw, map 18D parcel two in the PRP zoning district. Welcome, Mr. Gerfine. Um, Chris, uh, can you give us the overview and remind us uh, why we're back with Mr. Gerfine? I know we talked about this several months ago and had some recommendations on what he could do with some of these new obstructions and uh, where do we stand? Yeah, so if Pam could bring up the, um, or Nate, bring up the plan that I prepared that shows where the concrete blocks are. And then I will explain that um, I received an email from a planning board member. I think it was Janet McGowan. And she had driven past the site and had noticed that um, there were, uh, concrete blocks um, in the driveway, and also um, I think the maps would show it best. Yeah, maybe scroll down. Anyway, she'd noticed that there were concrete blocks in the driveway, and also, <clears throat> oh, that's not going to show it. There is there is a an eleven by seventeen map. Um, that there it is yeah okay so there are two blocks in the driveway which is labeled there two blocks there's a crosswalk right in front of that to the east i guess and then um, when you get down 
into the fenced in area, there are 10 more blocks and they're kind of large. And I'm afraid we don't have, I didn't provide pictures this time. I did provide pictures last time, but they're, um, you know, they're fairly large. They're a little bit like Jersey barriers, but not quite as big as Jersey barriers. So anyway, um, Janet brought these to my attention and she said that, um, you know, they weren't on the site plan when it was originally approved. And that is correct. They weren't on the site plan. So um, <clears throat> the building commissioner said, well, um, you know, Mr. Gerfine can remove these because they weren't on the original site plan or you can come back to the planning board and talk to the planning board about um, about these changes. And um, so that's kind of where we are. The planning board did have a discussion last summer about this, and I'm not sure. I don't think Mr. Griffin was here during that discussion because um, Bruce proposed uh, a, a solution which involved um, leaving the blocks in the driveway, but putting some sort of um, wooden um, slats on them to make them more appealing, make them more visually appealing. But Mr. Griffin didn't, uh, uh, didn't approve that uh, suggestion. And also he wants to leave these blocks in place, the two blocks in the driveway and the 10 blocks within the fence. So that's really what I have to report. Janet may have more to report. And then I'm not sure if anybody ever took a site visit here other than Janet and myself. But in any event, that's about all I have to say. So we're here to talk to Mr. Gerfine about whether he uh, really needs to have these blocks here. And if he does, he may need to come back and amend his site plan. <clears throat> all right. Welcome, Mr. Gerfine. Hello, good evening. Uh, I guess uh, maybe we should start with an explanation from you about or a description of, of what kind of problems you were trying to solve when you installed these blocks. Okay, so um, I did not want to spend the extra $3,000 to have them brought in, et cetera. I don't like them either. They're not so aesthetically, the ones in the, in the property, they're not aesthetically pleased. I don't like them myself. Um, but the reason I have them is because they're functional. Um, my concern was that people would with you know by accident would crash into the greenhouse or would drive over the tight tank the septic tank which i have in the ground there the department of environment the dep actually very much likes the fact that i have those barriers there to protect the tank from getting driven on even though it's an industrial tank that can withstand being driven on they still like the fact that they're there. Um, the issues that Chris brought up to me originally were that, and the other members of the board, which had dealt with the, the plan originally, um, what I believe the concerns were is that the two, two, two issues. One, that the uh, dumpster was, would not be, um, be able to be brought to where it needed to be, which it can. It's not an issue for the dumpster. There's plenty of room for the dumpster. The other issue was um, that someone had mentioned that it blocks or impedes access to the tank, which exactly is not the case at all. Um, and anyone and everyone from the town is welcome to come at any time and inspect and see. Um, it doesn't impede in any, if, it, if anything, it's only they're there to protect the tank from being driven on. Uh, um, uh, Mr. Gerfine, I can't tell from the site plan here exactly where the tank is it, I right. assume it's below grade is it is it underneath the driveway paving no sir it's um it is if if you're driving into the property it's on the left um okay uh, near the door let's see let me try and look real quick and see um is it is it is it the Device at the left hand end of the building in, on um, the drawing. Is that it? it? You know, I, I'll give you, I'll tell you where it is. If if you're if you're outside of the property in the street, there's a little private street there, which is part of the property that I own. Okay. If you're in the street looking at the property, so you'll see the line of black 
um, you know, you'll see the line depicting the black jersey barriers, right? You see those? Please. So to the to close to the greenhouse, um, the 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 uh, yeah, right, right where that right, right there, right exactly where the cursor is, right there. That's where the tank is, right there. Okay, so thank you. Away from the greenhouse, just slightly about ten feet out. Well, not ten feet, you know, ten feet in the scale of the, not not the other way, the other way. If you if you put it back, uh, yeah, a little further out, a little a little further out, a few more, a little like a uh, yeah, right there. The tank is right there, exactly right there is where the tank is. Okay. So the tank, the, so the issues that Chris originally brought up to me, because she may not remember, because she has so many things on her, on you know, to deal with, but I do remember, because it's the only project I'm dealing with. So the issues were accessibility for the uh, dumpster, which is not a problem, um, accessibility to the tank, which it's protecting. Um, the issue was aesthetics, was the other issue. Now, just so we're clear, you can't see these blocks unless you purposefully come into the property. So if you were to see them from the street, I would understand why people wouldn't like them or anything. Those are only the ones in the property, which I thought about putting um, maybe vegetation or hanging plants or something, because honestly, I don't like them either. I, I really don't. They do not look aesthetically pleasing. They're really there for functionality. I did not want to spend the extra $3,000 to bring them in with a truck and everything else. It was more money I didn't want to spend, but I felt it necessary to protect the tank and the greenhouse because if someone comes in too fast in the driveway by accident and there's snow or they don't see or they're backing up, I can't afford to have them run into the greenhouse and break the wall down because I'll be, you know, have a real problem on my hands, you know, with sterility, with safety. It's another issue. Actually, one of the other issues that I thought of having them there and extended them further out toward the gate rather than having them just at to protect the tank was for security. So no one can just drive up to the building and crash through the wall saying, oh, let me just, you know, thieves do anything these days. They drive through the wall, think, oh, let me punch a hole in this wall. I'll run in, run in, grab a bunch of merchandise and drive away. So that's another reason why the barriers are there. Now to the, we can get back to those in a second, but to the ones in the street, uh, Chris might remember that I actually did come to her in the town, not in front of the planning board, but I did request, I, 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 I did ask permission from her in the town and she, she may remember, she may not, this may refresh her memory that we spoke with one of the town, um, not the engineers, but one of the gentlemen from the town, I forget his name, who dealt with the streets and what's allowed. And what he basically told me and Chris back a while back is that it's a private road. Most of it belongs to Mr. Gordon Hall, but that little section is my private road so I could do what I want. Now, I'm not saying that because I'm trying to be argumentative or fighting with the town. Um, I'm just letting you know what was the case. Um, I don't, the Jersey Barry's out front there. Maybe someone else has seen them or not. They're not beautiful. They're not horrible. They're white. I need to put reflective barriers on them for safety in case of snow. I'm, I have all that ready to go. Um, the issue is just aesthetics, really. The proposed um, uh, design from one of the previous board members, I saw it, to be honest, I wasn't crazy about it. It's just more money. It's just wood. I don't know that it would really change the aesthetics to be more pleasing. I think, honestly, if anything, it would just be more of a monstrosity. Now, why did I put the two blocks there? You say, okay, why are you putting them there, Jonathan? I'm putting them there because what happens a lot is people will drive into that little street there at all hours of the day and night before I'm there and they'll park there and they'll eat meals and then they'll discard all their refuse all over my property. And every few days, literally, I'm cleaning up like a garbage man. And honestly, 
I don't want to play garbage men every three days because people want to throw their Cumberland Farms wrappers and their, their Dunkin' Donuts wrappers there. So it's really kind of a deterrent is why they're there. Um, the fire trucks need 10 feet. Those are probably 15 to 17 feet apart. All right, thank you. Um, Chris, you have your hand up. Yeah, I just wanted to note that Mr. Gerfine did state um, during the public hearing in November of 2019 that he was planning to put um, cement blocks there. It's in the, let's see, under the public hearing, it's in the third paragraph down. Um, and he stated that the DPW had agreed with his plan to put those concrete blocks there. So the so the two blocks in the driveway were mentioned at the public uh, hearing. And um, I don't know if the planning board knew what they were going to look like then, but uh, just wanted to make sure that you knew that, that the planning board had heard that he was going to do that. All right. Uh, but it, am I correct? It's your opinion that if we if if Mr. Gerfine wants to keep these blocks in their locations, he needs to come back to us as a at a public hearing with a revised site plan. I think what he needs to do he, he needs to show these blocks on a site plan. These two blocks here because they they weren't shown on the site plan, although they were mentioned in the meeting. But he needs to remove the ones that are within the fence because those are the ones that weren't shown on the site plan and weren't. Um, or, mentioned or, or, he, or he could provide a new site plan that includes them. Yes, and I think the building commissioner, I don't know if he's still here, but I believe the building commissioner thought that he would need to um, come back uh, with a new site plan application if he wanted to keep those blocks that are within the fence. Okay. All right. So, uh, Nate, I'm going to go to you next. Sure, thanks. <clears throat> I think it, the, this is coming to the planning board to determine if these changes are substantial enough from, you know, a derogation, you know, a derivation from the site plan that it needs to come back, right? So the building commissioner didn't, you know, wasn't willing to say one way or the other, he wanted to come to the board for your review and, and determination. So the board could determine that these changes are de minimis and not substantial enough to require a new site plan, or you could say that you think they are based on, you know, aesthetics design or whatever, and want, you know, want to see a revised site plan. So I, I really think it's the board's determination whether or not these are, you know, sub, a substantial enough change to the site plan that it requires right. amending it. Okay, thanks, Nate. Um, Janet. So I, I, the only blocks that I knew about or noticed were the ones that we're looking at right now, the two blocks. And I thought they were unsafe because um, I have driven down that piece of road thinking I was heading towards Valley Medical. It's a little clear, unclear. Um, and so I just thought they'd be really easy to drive to, into in you know dusk or you know dark and stuff like that. So I don't know if the answer, I don't feel like you know pushing um, through to a whole new site plan that seems kind of arduous. I didn't know anything about the blocks around the rest of the property. I think somebody else brought that up. Um, maybe Nate did or somebody, I can't remember now, but I, I just think those blocks are really hard to see. And so I don't know if just painting them a bright color would help. Um, but I do really think that it's, they just, to me, they seem, you know, they're not attractive, but they're, to me, the issue is, I think they're just not safe. Yeah, no, I, I, I agree. Uh, I, just, if I, could just up real quick. I was going to, I was thinking of painting them white and red for the safety issue. Um, uh, and then I do have uh, four foot high posts that I'm going to drill into those with reflectors, which will be at uh, three feet and four feet, you know, um, for safety reasons. So I, I, I totally agree with, with that um, comment about safety. So, uh, so Mr. Gerfine, it sounds like uh, between the building official and uh, the fact that these two blocks here don't show up on the site plan at the moment, um, are you willing to provide a new site plan and come back for well, well, like, a like, public hearing? Well, look, I mean, like uh, the gentleman said, I, I didn't catch his name, I apologize. Um, I, I feel the same way. I feel that you know, making me come back for a whole review of the site plan. 
is a little bit extreme for what I did there. I mean, what I did, so you just understand, is all, first of all, they're not permanent. These are not permanent structures. They can be moved. Um, they're there for safety. Um, obviously, I do not want to create any hazardous situation. Just to clarify, there are two different things there. The ones in the street and the ones inside. The ones inside are really there to protect the building from getting driven into by potential thieves. It's there to protect the tank from being driven on. And it's there to protect the greenhouse from anyone sliding or driving or backing into the greenhouse by accident, whatever the case may be, so whether it be we, dark or snowy or what have you. Okay. So th those are for a safety issue. Um, and they're not seen, they're not in anyone's way. They're not hindering the garbage and they're not hindering access to the tank, which were the issues that Chris had brought up to me a while back. The ones in the street, if the town wants me to move them, I'll move them. Uh, I, I, like I said, do I need them there? No, I put them there for various reasons as a deterrent for people coming in there because it's a cannabis facility. Deterrence from coming in, seeing theft, et cetera, right? So it's kind of saying don't come in. Um, so it's from people to keep them out of there. So they go up to Valley. So they may see, oh, this is not the entrance. Go to Valley. For deterring people from parking there and disposing their refuse. Um, I can get rid of them. I mean, you know, I'm not, it's not like I'm married to these things, you know. Um, okay. But, but to your question, direct, direct your question. Look, obviously, if the board requires me, obviously, I'd have to come back with a site plan. I think that in, in all honesty, like the previous gentleman said, um, that, you know, it might be a little bit extreme for that, that if we could just figure out how to, you know, how the board is satisfied, the town is satisfied you know, without the whole review, because the town's busy enough to go through the whole litigious review again. And honestly, I'm, a, I'm trying to, I'm, a, I'm almost done. I just want to focus on finishing this thing without having to worry about reviews again. To be honest. Okay, thank you. Um, Chris, if, if, if this board decides that all of this is de minimis, would you or Rob in particular object? I would not object. And should we consult Rob or not? It sounded like he thought we needed a new site plan if he's leaving the blocks inside the fence. Yes, he said that last summer, but we can go back and ask him again. Nate? If the board is willing to approve this um, on a site plan, maybe the site plan I drew, um, Rob right. may be willing to not with it. Nate? <clears throat> yeah, thanks, Doug. Um, you know, I guess what, you know, uh, Jonathan did mention though we had um, posts that may be put in. So I, I might, you know, I would ask for clarification on that. And then, you know, there is, um, you know, as Jenna mentioned, I do think that people may not realize um, that the road actually turns left. You know, it's almost a 90 degree turn. And so, you know, in the summer, there was some discussion about, you know, what Bruce had mentioned was, you know, could there be a way to um, make it clear that this is private property? And so, you know, that's, I guess that's, you know, in my mind, still a question. You know, we, I know that we would want deliveries and, you know, some cars are coming in here and parking and other things, but, you know, I, I guess I was curious, Jonathan, when you mentioned, my name's Nate, uh, yes, I know the town, but when you mentioned the the vertical elements, you know, I was wondering, you know, what, what exactly you mean for, so, you know, is it? Right, okay, so basically- well, whoa, 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 I'm just trying to get the parameters and what, I, I'm not sure, I, I mean, I'm not sure I wanna really have a long conversation about this tonight. Right, but I think for instance, if the vertical posts are numerous and many, that might change whether this is de minimis or not, in my mind, right? Like, well, I'm not sure Yeah. What, yeah, I mean, right, right. I'll be very brief if you want to give me two seconds. Go ahead. But oh, um, so yeah, so they're four feet tall. So they, they'd reach a height of four feet tall, two on each block, and uh, four reflectors on each block. So uh, two reflectors on each post. Um, 
And I, I also have a, I have actually a, a very simple farm gate. It's a, it's a very simple gate, which I was, I wasn't sure if I was going to use or not, which I thought about affixing to one of the blocks as a, uh, just a swing door that would never be locked, that could just easily be just be pushed open, um, just as another way to signify that this is a closed road that people shouldn't drive down there, et cetera. Um, so they, Mr. Mr. Gerfine, would you be willing to provide a drawing of what you are proposing to do at this location? Sure, um, absolutely. Uh, I would recommend you provide us with a drawing before you do anything. Sure. And since we may want to comment on your plan before you do it. Sure. Um, absolutely, absolutely. Um, right. If I just might interject one thing real quick, I believe um, that Rob may have, uh, you know, taken that position depending on the issues which I mentioned earlier that the access to the tank, because people on the board thought those blocks hindered the access to the tank to pump it out which it doesn't, it's only protecting the tank. And the other issue was uh, the garbage, uh, you know, putting a, a dumpster, that's also not an issue. So those are issues he might've been taking into consideration when he made, you know, saying if it needs to be brought again. All right, so board members, I think that the, the decision for tonight is do we wanna have a longer conversation about this with Mr. Gerfine and have him pro pro provide some more drawings for review, or do we consider this de minimis and we should uh, not pursue it further? I can see someone is sketching on the screen. Yes, hi, Doug, that's me. So I was just suggesting that if, right, I mean, if the, the purpose is to indicate that this is private property, I mean, could there be, you know, more than four, but say like six of those vertical posts with reflectors, right? Yeah. reflective bands and then a gate in the middle so you know it could be three and three or whatever but that way right. yeah. it really is it's it's apparent that this isn't the road right right, right. I, mean, I think right now i agree that someone could come in and hit these blocks without thinking that they're right you know going in the roadway yeah i know absolutely is, absolutely right. so i, yeah, anyways, I just, totally agree i totally agree. i'm just throwing an idea out there like what you know what could be yeah uh, yeah right and, and you know, when we talked about this before, Bruce had done a sketch and that seemed like it was too much uh, and, you know, not right. agreeable to uh, to Jonathan. Well, I think, honestly, I think it would have just looked messy. I really do. It wasn't, it okay. wasn't, I, I just think it would have just been just, All right. I think neighbors would have looked at it and be like, what is this monstrosity? But yeah, what I'll do is I'll, I'll draw something up, et cetera. Um, and, uh, you know, I can even affix the, the, the fence there, the, it's a very simple fence. It's steel, but it's just, it's simple, no locks or anything. Um, so I can set it up actually with the reflectors and the gate and take pictures and bring you actual pictures of what I did. And if the board says, well, change this, paint it that, we don't like them, get rid of them, I'll do that too. Look, you know, I, I like I always, you know, I want to work with the town. I'm not, I'm not trying to fight the town. The, the only reason I have these things there are really for deterrence and safety, uh, like I said. Okay. Andrew? Thanks, Doug. Um, I, I'm like reluctant to even say anything, but I mean, doesn't the fence already function as a deterrent for people? Yeah, but what's happening is this. I'll reiterate again. What's happening is this. In, in off hours, all times of night, but, six but, in the morning. In but the that's evening. closed, right? What? I mean, this, I'm trying to draw on the... I know, the, the yeah, the gate the, is closed. The gate, yeah. The, the gate so is closed. But what happens is, you see where the red car is? I do. Yeah. Okay, that's a little dead-end street there. Yes. Yeah, I'm, okay. I'm aware of this. Yeah, I've, I've been here before. Right. I go to Valley Medical. All okay, the time. so what happens is all the time is people will come, they'll park there. And they'll eat Cumberland Farms and 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 and, and uh, uh, Dunkin' Donuts from up the road. Yeah, they yeah. eat their breakfast and they literally. I, I in, in my life I would never do that because that's not how I was brought up. They take their breakfast, 
and they literally dump it out their window right on my driveway. They're like, here you go, happy birthday. And it's it's regular and I'm sick of it. So if I can put deterrence in, you know, it just, it's annoying. And, and I would say just for what it's worth though, the concrete, like to me, when I see concrete, I think it's an abandoned property. Right. And that may be why people are doing that is they think that it's it's no, they were doing it before they were doing it like they were doing it before and they drive. What happened? They drive in there now still, you know, and and I go up to them. People drive. I say, you know, hi, how are you? And I try to be nice about it. I say, look, this is private property, et cetera. And I just want to get people, anyone in the area from the habit of not going in there. Um, Since you added the concrete blocks, has the. Have the num have the frequency of, of littering reduced? Um, I'd have, say have they have they yes. had any impact? I I, I would say yes because I think people realize when they see those blocks they're like oh that's not it and I think that if I put the 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 gate the farm gate there which is a nice looking gate um, I think if I put and it just swings either way you know. Um, uh, I think if I put the gate there with reflectors on there, that would be even more apparent. And then they would be like, okay, they, they wouldn't drive in there at all. I mean, it wouldn't be locked. You know, it wouldn't be locked. There's no need to have it locked. It's just, like I said, it's just a deterrent. You know, it really is a, just a deterrent. Okay, Karen. Um, with Andrew, those concrete blocks do make it, they, as you said, they're aesthetically so unpleasing. And yet they're far apart. They look like something that got dropped there and is out of place. And if it was me, I would also, I just go there and park and think, well, this is kind of a dump. I don't think, I think no, if you put think in a garbage, that. if you put in a gate and put in some signs that say proper, uh, private property, and um, uh, even, even those little uh, red marks that Nate put in there, that four of them, are already a relief uh, because it says, okay, this is the end, don't enter here. But the block standing alone won't do that. So I'm looking forward to your drawing of um, putting on the, the reflectors and the gate. I think that will improve it. Well, what I'm gonna do is I'm actually gonna affix them. I'm gonna affix everything and take a picture and then give you the actual picture instead of just a drawn picture. And you folks can take a look at it and see if it's okay with you. All right. Does um, that sound like a plan? Anybody object to that? We'll have Mr. Gerfine come back in a month or something. Andrew. I, I'm just saying, why not draw it up and make sure we're good before you actually build it? Oh, because it would only take me a half hour to put these things on. I mean, it's just a matter of drilling the you know, the metal into it's, it's to take it apart, it would take me 10 minutes to put it together it would take me probably 10 minutes. It's not like, you know, coming I because I, look, I mean, you know, to actually see what the end product is and just seeing a drawn sketch obviously would be, you know, to see the actual product, I think would be, you know, a little. And if I'm going to be coming back to you folks in a month, I mean, I guess, you know, it wouldn't make a difference. All right, Chris, why don't we put Mr. Gerfine on the agenda? For December 21st? Yeah, if we've got room. Well, you so far, all you have is uh, Archipelago that night. Okay, and we've been through most of that. Nate? Yeah, I mean, so I, what I was just showing was the, um, you know, here's an aerial image with the property boundary. And so it is, I think it's just the road layout is confusing, right, because of the turn here. But I guess I'm confused, you know, these posts you're talking about, these reflective posts, you're going to drill them into and then set them on top of the concrete blocks, right? So they're going to be like six feet tall on top no. of the blocks. No, no, they're going to be drilled into the front. I, yeah, I guess we can wait to see. I mean, I I was thinking about in my drawing was actually having bollards that you core through the con, you know, through the asphalt and you have them in the road and you remove the blocks. You just have the, some posts with a gate. Um, oh, that's a whole other. I'd have to drill and cost and buy, and that'd be that'd be a whole 
Another. I mean, we, but the, this whole project is, I mean, it, the whole thing is a project. And so no, I, I understand. the concern that. is that the planning board heard a complaint and it's, you know, it's, it's not only is it about aesthetics, it's about safety and, and everything. And so I think, you know, I mean, you know, I guess, like I said, we can wait to see the drawing and then it's the board's decision of, as to how they want to proceed, but it could be that they recommend other solutions uh, than what, you know, what the drawing might show or the image might show. Yeah, you, I mean, I agree with Nate. You are taking a risk by doing anything further without a drawing that shows what you want to do. But if it's only a half an hour and you don't mind no, putting, look, putting it's a not, hole it's, in your concrete blocks, then no, it's not a big deal. It's not. It's like you know, it, it, it's not a big deal to put them on or to show you folks what it actually would be and to take them off or whatever the case may be. You know. All right, so why don't we just plan to see Mr. Gerfine in, in another month? And thank you for your patience this evening. And oh, no problem. It took, a lot, it took us a while to get to you. Yep. All right. Okay. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. All right, uh, so the time now is 10.05. And I don't see that we have any other old business, Chris. Is that correct? No other old business. All right. Any new business? Can't think of anything. Uh, about Form A, A and R subdivision. No Form A's. No. ZBA applications? No, sir. Was that a no? That was a no. Mm -hmm. OK. Thank you. How about SPP, SPR, SUBs? Nothing that we haven't told you about already. OK. Moving on to planning board committee and liaison reports. Bruce, uh, have you succeeded in getting on the PVP? Not, no, not yet. Um, although I'm not for one of trying on Chris's part. Um, uh, but I haven't seen anything from uh, Jack, so I imagine that there has been no meeting. And uh, um, that's my report. Okay. Um, Andrew, CPAC. Thanks, Doug. Um, we had a meeting last Thursday. We got the four community housing presentations, um, another meeting tomorrow night, and then um, one the week after. So moving along, keep it again. If you have any questions, the community housing portion is done. If you have any questions relative to historic preservation or open space or rec, um, feel free to flip them over. Thanks. All right. Thank you, Tom. Nothing to report since our last meeting. All right, Janet. Um, I frankly can't really remember what we talked about at the last solar bylaw working group, but I was gonna. Um, I sent out the 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 states um, 2025 20, 2030 um, plan for reducing carbon. And um, there's another plan that will be coming down the pike for how to reach the 2020, 2050 goals. It's so then anyway, the 2025, 2030 plan is really long, but Martha Hanner um, on the solar bylaw working group has a presentation on it with some nice PowerPoint things. And it's really useful to sort of see what the state strategy and plan is for carbon reductions and alternative energies. And so she is willing to come to the planning board and present that. Um, it takes about 20 minutes and it, I think it will give a good context to the planning board when we get the solar bylaw, which is you know being drafted at this moment. Have, have there been any drafts circulated or public posted on the on your committee's website? Well, we're doing kind of like a first pass, like the planning department just did a purposes statement and as they go through sections, we're gonna look at them, but we haven't done the community outreach part to determine community values. So it's kind of like a first pass and then um, you know, a deeper pass in the in 2023. I could circulate um like the Cape Cod Planning Commission draft or um the PVPA draft, which gives a really good background in the choices that have to be made. So uh -huh. Okay. Well, I think we've. I think I've at least seen the Cape Cod information and also the PVPC uh, information. So it doesn't sound like you really have anything new yet. 
Yeah. So if people are interested in Martha's presentation, she could do it in December or January. She's okay. she's done it. She's given it to different um, groups as well as us, us. Like she's been talking to different um, precincts. Mm -hmm. District. Uh, Chris, I know you circulated the link to tomorrow night's briefing for the ZBA on solar bylaw uh, issues. And um, so everybody's invited to that too. Chris? Just that it's the um, attorney uh, from KP Law who's going to give the Zoning Board of Appeals um, training on what they can and can't require of a solar array because they have a few that are coming uh, through the pipeline. And um, they also have a battery project that's coming through the pipeline. So, yeah, so that's what that's all about. And um, I've only heard from three planning board members who thought they might want to come. So I didn't post it as a planning board meeting. So if you if you do come, I'm happy to have you there, but don't engage in too much conversation about it. OK. OK. And um, Chris, should we should we take uh, Janet's the, the woman from the state up on on doing the uh, Oh, um, Martha, briefing. Martha's um, a member of the Solar Bylaw Working Group and a, a retired NASA astrophysicist. <laughs> she's quite she's quite dynamic. But would she's that, would she's that be something we can maybe put on the agenda in early January? I think January would work best. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So let's let's try to do that. Johanna. Janet talking about the solar bylaw reminded me that I ran into Alan Snow, the tree warden today, and he mentioned something about a new tree ordinance and something about the town wanting to put forward a concerted effort to protect shade, large mature shade trees in town. Um, he was talking to me in the context of like, on the plant, like, oh, you're on the planning board. You should be thinking about this as you're thinking about the solar bylaw. So um, I guess, Chris, he had mentioned that he brought it to you. I don't know if it's, uh, you know, I don't know if now is the point to address it, but I was just curious where that's at and how much it extends and overlaps with our purview. Chris? They brought it to me a few years ago when it was in a very um, early stage. So I haven't seen it recently, but I could reach out to Alan and ask him about that and ask him if it's um, something that he would like to present to the planning board. Okay. All right, thank you, Janet. Um, and that leaves Chris for CRC. Anything, um, anything you wanted to share? The CRC is going to be looking at the um, food and drink bylaw tomorrow with Nate and me, they were waiting until the planning board made its uh, recommendation before they closed their public hearing and made their recommendation. So we're gonna be reporting to them mm -hmm. um, about your action tonight. Okay. And they have, um, like you did, they recommended the flood map um, zoning bylaw and the firm maps and the whole package having to do with flood maps. I guess that was at their last meeting. So that's that's all. Okay. All right. Um, no report from the chair this evening. Any report from staff? No report from staff. All right. Time is ten or twelve minutes after ten, and uh, I think we can adjourn. Thank, Thank you all. Thank you for another three and a half plus hour meeting. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Thanks, everybody. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night.